Good morning. Good morning. I'll read from the top of the morning. The legal voters of the town of Woodbury, Vermont, are hereby warned and notified to meet at the Woodbury Elementary School Gymnasium on Saturday, March 2nd, 2024 at 10 a.m. to take action on the following articles. This meeting will come to order. We begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Additionally, we'll have a moment of silence to remember our neighbors, friends, and family who died this past year. Good morning, neighbors. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Pardon me. Traditionally, we also temporarily disconnect the freezer. There's no objection. <laughs> I am Stephen Murphy, town moderator, and I am pleased to be with you today. I'll give a brief introduction on four points of order. The rules, articles, debate, and voting, and then we'll proceed. Number one, the rules. Robert's rules of order are the basic rules of order for this meeting, except where Vermont state law takes precedence. You. Members of this assembly cannot change Vermont law, but by unanimous consent or by a two-thirds vote, you can change Robert's rules. You have a right to challenge the rulings made by the moderator. Please tell the moderator if you think that they have ruled improperly. The job of the moderator is to facilitate the will of the voters. Number two, articles. An article must be moved and seconded, then stated by the moderator, before it is under consideration and debate may begin. An article may have only one amendment at a time associated with it, and likewise, that amendment may have only one amendment at a time associated with it. With respect to an article, an amendment may not change its subject or its objective or the means of achieving that objective. Number three, debate. All motions, remarks, and discussion must be addressed to the moderator, who will do their best to recognize you in the order that you raised your hands. After being recognized, please stand up and state your name. We need this information for the minutes, and we welcome you to come to the microphone. Not required, but we welcome you to the microphone. Under Robert's rules, speeches will be limited to 10 minutes. After you've spoken once on an issue, 
you may not speak on it a second time until every other member of the assembly has had an opportunity to speak on it once. You may be allowed to speak a third time by unanimous consent or a two-thirds vote. Speeches must be confined to the merits of the question. You may not engage in personal attacks on a member of the assembly or on their motives. Debate may be cut off by a motion to call the question with a second and then a two-thirds vote. But you must be recognized to make this motion to call the question. Fourth item, voting. A vote by division of the House may be called by one voter after a voice vote. A vote by paper ballot may be called by seven voters after a voice vote or after a vote by division of the House. Or, according to Woodbury tradition, and without objection now, and here by unanimous consent, a paper ballot may be called by seven voters before a voice vote or before a, vo a vote by division of the House. Hearing no objection, let us proceed. Reconsideration of an article is permitted until the point at which the assembly begins consideration of another article. A motion for reconsideration must be made by a member who voted with the prevailing side. So the moderator will need to ask how you voted. Now. At this time, I ask those who are not legal voters in the town of Woodbury, please raise your hands. And introduce yourselves, stating your names, please. My name is Jeffrey Seaver. I'm from Connecticut. Jeffrey Seaver from Connecticut. Welcome, Okay, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, as our neighbors have stated and is written here also, you are welcome here. However, you may not vote. <laughs> and unless there is a suspension of the rules, you may not make motions or speak in debate. So, if there is no objection, let us proceed. Oh, pardon me. One more person indicated that they are not a legal voter of Vermont. Would you please state your name? Emmett Gordon. Emmett Gordon. Welcome, Emmett Gordon. Welcome, Emmett. Excuse me? <laughs> yeah. So, let us proceed. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 1? And at this point, I'm going to step down from the podium, leaving the responsibility to preside over Article 1 to a member of the Select Board. My name is Chris Codius. I am a current select board member. Article 1 states who shall be elected moderator for this town meeting. Patrick Foot, I nominate uh, Stephen Burton. So I have a second from Skip Marcassani. I have a first and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. With near unanimous consent. 
Stephen Murphy, please continue as moderator. Thank you very much. The next article, Article 2. To consider the printed report of the town officers for the year ending December 31st, 2023. Is there a motion? I recognize Patrick Flood. Yes. Patrick Flood, yes. Yeah. I move we accept the report as written. Okay. Would, you, would you like to change the, the amend the, the article? First, we need to have it moved as stated to consider the printed report of the town officers for the year ending December 31st, 2023. Would you allow me to repeat my motion? Would, would you like to move the article to, to get it under debate? Yes, I want to move the article. Article two is moved by Patrick Flood. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes? Michael Sadler seconds the motion. So I'll restate it and then we'll, we'll begin discussion. Article two, to consider the printed report of the town officers for the year ending December 31st, 2023. Is there discussion on article two? Yes. I recognize Steve Freihofner. Thanks. We've known each other for years. I'm glad. <laughs> My vision hasn't failed. <laughs> Though I do have glasses now, so but I still recognize you. This is uh, uh, more of a point of order. The uh, Woodbury representatives to the Hazen and the uh, Mountain View School Board uh, are here, and we're available uh, to give a very brief rundown of, of what's going on at the board. Uh, if you want to do that now, um, we can give you a, a brief general overview, just a couple of minutes. And we'll be available at the uh, end of the meeting for the last article if uh, there are more detailed questions you want to ask. But uh, Mr. Moderator, it's up to the assembly if uh, they want to hear briefly from uh, the representatives of the uh, high school and the elementary school. We're available to do that. Our town officers are listed in our town report. Uh, they're here and available for questions and comments. So without objection, by unanimous consent, we'll have some discussion with the, the officials who represent our school boards. Could I have a point of order? Yes, um, point of order. I Ginger. just want to point out that our rep elected representatives in Montpelier will be here in a little bit. Okay. I've I'd like them to know what our schools are, are up against. Uh, Steve, is that, is that acceptable? Uh, whatever the body wants is fine. Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll defer that to later, and then we can, we can put it to the assembly again. Is there other discussion under Article 2 about the report of the town officers? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to our, on to Article 3. Who shall be elected to fill the following positions as town officers? The first office to be filled by election is select board member for a term of three years. Yes, uh, recognize Patrick Flood. Uh, Patrick Flood, I nominate Chris Casey. Okay. We have a nomination for Chris Casey. Second. Uh, seconded. Okay. Uh, I, I, I saw it. I'm going to second it. Okay. Okay. Are there other nominations for select board member for a term of three years? Oh, okay. I nominate yes. Monty Shatney. Brandy Smith nominates Monty Shatney. Okay? Okay. Bob Blake seconds. 
Are there other nominations for the position of select board member? Okay, hearing none, without objection by unanimous consent, we will close nominations and proceed with the vote. Voting for select board member must be conducted by ballot. So we will ask the Board of Civil Authority to conduct the vote by paper ballot.
extra copies of them. to see if everyone who wishes to vote on this article has voted before we close the, the voting. Okay, it appears that everyone has voted who wishes to. So, by unanimous consent, without objection, we'll close the voting. And the Board of Civil Authority will count the votes.
Results of the vote, or the, the, okay. the vote totals, and then it's my job to say who, what, what the result of the election was, who won. So would you, you okay, say, so you, you just say there were, t you know, there were 106 votes, votes cast. Okay. And then you go down the line. Chris Cody okay. received one granny, and then. Okay. And then write down, and then I will say based on the results. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello, folks. <laughs> folks. <laughs> Okay, the votes are in and counted. I'm going to turn it over to our town clerk, Robin Durkee, now to, his, to announce the, uh, the totals of the votes cast here. We had 119 people sign in today. Out of that 119, 106 people voted. There was one vote for Chris Codius, one for Brandy Smith, 82 for Chris Carey, 22 for Monty Shatney. Yep. I, 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 wait, well, I Chris Perry? let's just clarify one thing before we move on. Chris Casey got 82 votes. Okay, thank you. 82. So let's, let, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, just... Just review the, the vote totals again in the names. Okay. okay. Chris Codius, one vote. Brandy Smith, one vote. Chris Casey, 82. Monty Shatney, 22. Okay, so we heard the results of the votes. Based on the voting results, Chris Casey is elected moderator for a term of three years. <laughs> Pardon me. Pardon me. Another correction. Based on the results of the vote just announced by our town clerk, Chris Casey is elected to the position of select board member for a term of three years.
Uh, yes? There's, there's Chris Casey. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, we have a question here. Can I, can I just make a, uh, Alex Peltz? Uh, I want to just make a formal thank you to Chris Codius, whose term's ending, and taking us through this tumultuous year. So thank you, Chris. Yes. Chris Codius is our outgoing select board member, has recently served as chair. Thank you. The next position under Article 3 up for election is for Lister for a term of three years. Are there nominations for the position of Lister? Yes, I recognize, recognize Bill Condon. Ron Wells. Okay, we have a nomination for Ron Wells. He, uh, he was elected last year. Oh. Term is now. Okay. We're informed that Ron that Wells is anyway. currently serving an active term. Is that correct? Yes, yes sir, he's currently serving an active term. Okay. Is there a, a nomination for the position of Lister for three years? Well, okay, we have, a, we have a question about the requirements. Sounds like a point of information. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, is there someone who could give an explanation uh, on the, the duties of the lister? Maybe Bob? Okay, recognize Bob Martin. I wasn't wrong. He did want, if he was here, he wanted to explain the What's involved? He said that uh, it takes quite a bit of training, his classes, and uh, it's, uh, as far as time goes, uh, there's times of the year when it's fairly busy, and there's uh, data entry into the system, and uh, then there's times of the year, like right now, when it's fairly calm, and it uh, involves mostly Property transfers, which there might be 50 of them, various types, and there'll be uh, compiling of the road list of places that need to be visited based on zoning permits or work that hasn't been completed from other years. And uh, the whole culmination of everything is when the grand list is filed with the and it's done. That's the end of the uh, Lister's work for the year. It generally has to be done in uh, completed. The plan list needs to be completed fairly earlier by state requirements than what we usually would get it done. And there's extensions granted to, uh, for a monthly basis to get it done. In time, the tax bills. In terms of hours, I think I saw where Ron at uh, $20 an hour was uh, approximately $5,000 a year. So that's pretty much what the hours were involved uh, for him. And he did, this past year, he's been three listeners, but I'll have to admit that Ron has done most of the work. That's what happened when Dave Sawyer was a solicitor. He did most of the work. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, they do like to have some help. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yes, I recognize Skip Marcassani. Uh, Skip Marcassani, South Shore Trail. Uh, to add to what Bob said, we need to be computer literate. Okay? Because the base, the book, a lot of the work essentially did. Secondly, you got to play well with others. That's <laughs> this is a team. Uh, you're not going to come into this job and sit down and do 
it without any training. Because you're going to have to go through some training. And the reason I'm up speaking is I'm the volunteer IT guy for the town. And I observe from the corners what's going on. And that's what I prefer. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have uh, any any more points of information? Yes, I recognize you. Please state your name. Yes. Yeah. Uh, bon Collins. From the, uh, I just have a question on what the training would be and how do we get signed up because I would um, express interest in that. Um, I'm a 25-year um, bookkeeper and accountant by trade, so data entry and you track of stuff. Sign her up. I worked in Washington Electric, uh, and when I went to them, I, 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 uh, <laughs> uh, I worked with them with their property taxes and fought, uh, you know, fought the various uh, towns with their property taxes. So, so I did a lot of work with uh, 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 calculating all their property uh, alliance. And, uh, so I'm a little bit familiar. So anyway, that's it. I wish Ron was here to hear that because he's not here. He's, he's uh, apparently not feeling very well today. Would you like to be my assistant? I just want to say at this point, um, in my view, it's important that we understand the nature of this position. So I'm recognizing members here to, to give a description on points of information by unanimous consent without objection. Uh, so, yeah, I now recognize Norm Etkin. Yes? Yeah, I'd like to nominate uh, Bonnie, Bonnie Collins. Bonnie Collins. Okay. I, I will second. <laughs> yes? Yes. What? what? Oops. Collins. For one second. We have a nomination for Bonnie Collins. And our town treasurer, Brandy Smith, wishes to add to the, the information here that's being exchanged. Hi, I'm Brandy Smith. To answer Bonnie's question, we have a little over $10,000 that the state puts into fund for Lister's education. Um, so yeah, it's, it's already funded. The money's there to, for training. Okay, thank you all for your information. It's very helpful. Are there other nominations for the position of Lister for a term of three years? Hearing none, without objection and by unanimous consent, we'll close nominations. This position must be elected by ballot. Is there a motion to instruct the clerk to cast one ballot for Bonnie Collins? We have a, uh, I, so, yes? I'll second, he can move. Okay, the motion is, is by Skip Marcusani, thank you, seconded by Paul Sumer. Okay, so the motion is to instruct the clerk to cast one ballot for Bonnie Collins for the position of Lister for a term of three years. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank All you, those <laughs> All those opposed, say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. The motion passes. The clerk will cast one ballot, and Bonnie Collins is elected. Mr. Thank you. Uh, yes, I recognize Norm Metkin. He's raising the point of order. Yes. Our representative, one of our two representatives for our district, uh, Washington Memorial District, Avram Pat, is here with us. And I will ask the assembly, um, by unanimous consent and without objection, we will invite Avram Pat to say some words. Okay, please.
let's get it just right. That work? Okay. Some are taller than others. <laughs> It's great to be here, and I, I, as I said, I, I do expect uh, uh, Saudi Arabia coming from different directions uh, to be here uh, very shortly. Uh, so I don't want to take up too much time out of your uh, town meeting. It's great. It's great that you have uh, that you actually have a live meeting in, in our district, which, as you know, has uh, four towns and. A small piece of Stowe also uh, this this uh, this time around after the redistricting, uh, towns are changing how they do their town meetings. Woodbury has decided uh, to have their meeting on Saturday. Um, two, two, on Tuesday, two of well three of the towns uh, will be having a town, town meeting live, but one town, Morristown, has decided not to have live meetings anymore at all, but to vote everything by, by, uh, by paper ballot. So as a legislator, uh, we, we all need to adjust and figure out what are the towns doing this year, and it may be different next year, who, you know, who knows. Um, uh, so I just uh, want to just give a brief update and start by saying that if you ever have any questions about what's going on at the legislature, obviously you can contact me or Saudi or your uh, uh, Washington County Senators, but I encourage people to look on the legislature's uh, website because it's a very, um, it, it's very actually fairly easy to use. It's um, uh, legislature.vermont.gov, G-O-V. And there you can find every bill, what the status, whether the, the bill is Take getting any action or not uh, in the House in this two-year session that we're in. There have been over 800 bills introduced. Most of those are not going to see action. Many of them will be combined into a larger bill so that they're not all going through separately. Uh, but you can see each committee and uh, what the committee is taking testimony on. You can see and hear uh, you can watch either live or recorded every committee hearing in the legislature, every full session of either the House or the Senate, and uh, also the contact information about all of your legislators, how to get a hold of them, uh, leave messages for them, email them, whatever. So I encourage people uh, to do that. And, and I, get, uh, I, get a, I get a lot, I hear a lot, uh, mostly by email, uh, from people in, in, in our towns, and I try to answer uh, all of them. Uh, what's happening in the legislature, I'll start with uh, one issue that is a hot topic in Vermont, uh, and that's property taxes this year, uh, particularly school property taxes and um, uh, Act 127 from, from last year. And uh, I have reported and written a little bit about that in my written reports, which uh, get posted uh, in, at Front Porch Forum here in Woodbury, if you see that. Also, the Hardwick Gazette has started um, uh, carrying my, my reports as well. I usually put them out about every two weeks, and, and the last one is from, from last week, just le leading up to right now. And, with the property taxes, it's a very difficult issue because, first of all, I'll start by saying Vermont is much more dependent on property taxes for paying for education than most other states. Other states also, many other states, uh, rely on property taxes to some extent, but Vermont is particularly heavy. So what, whatever happens in any one year uh, with property taxes, uh, will affect uh, us and the schools uh, much more than in, in some other states. Um, the uh, adjustments that were made with Act um, <clears throat> 127, which were um, an attempt to achieve more equity across the state um, uh, in education funding, because when you rely this heavily on property taxes, as we do, uh, you're going to have great differences from one town to the next about uh, 
what the property values are in that town, what the uh, median income is, are the people are there people wealthier in one town than another? In other words, what can the town and uh, or the towns in a school district afford? Um, and that varies uh, can vary very very greatly, which is not equitable uh, for the students. Students in one school, uh, the, the the district can afford to pay more uh, per student and another less. And th this is an attempt to even that out a, a little bit and to make it a state, but really a statewide tax, not so much by town. Um, because of a number of different circumstances, this particular year, it's, it's caused, uh, uh, the term is unintended consequences, and that's why uh, we've taken a step back, but not solved the problem yet. Uh, but I want to uh, emphasize that underlying all of that uh, is the fact that across the state, in December, early December, a letter by law is supposed to be presented to the legislature, prepared by the legislature's uh, joint fiscal staff and the administration, in which they have asked all of the school districts in the state at that point in time to estimate what it what their um, budgets look like going forward. And that was a scary letter because this, the, the, across the state, it was an average of like 15, 20% or more. Um, and so underlying whatever the state tries to do, whatever we try to do in the legislature is the fact that spending has increased dramatically as it has, um, uh, uh, as costs have increased also for every business in the state of Vermont, for our town governments, and for all of us individually. We don't see it as much when we go to the grocery store and buy a few items at the grocery store, but it's also going up by, by that, um, that percent. You do definitely see it when you see your tax bill with the whole amount for a year right there. On, on, you know, so it's very, very dramatic and it confronts you. But I do want to emphasize that costs have gone up for, for many reasons, whether it's energy costs, health insurance costs, supplies, um, uh, pretty, pretty much everything. And um, that's not something we can write a bill and say, make that, make that go away. Um, that, that's, so uh, I know school boards and uh, uh, select boards are doing their best way where they can to limit those costs, but they are they are going up. So uh, that's that's been a difficult issue, and I certainly have heard from lots of people uh, across all of the towns in our district, and um, having to explain what I've just explained because people want to blame the legislature, and the legislature has some responsibility in this, obviously, but it's it's a much more complicated thing than that. Uh, moving on, I want to say that uh, yesterday um, the House passed in agreement with the Senate the Budget Adjustment Act of, for the year. That's to adjust the current budget that we're in. We do that every year. It's a, and, sent, and sent it off to the governor. The House started with the bill, sent it to the Senate. They made some changes. Some um, uh, agreements were made between the House and Senate and we voted to approve that yesterday. The governor uh, is uh, intending to sign it. It's usually a routine kind of bill where it's just some, some things are higher, some things are lower than, than what you thought, but in this year, also last year, there's a lot else going on. Um, there is, um, first of all, there has been a lot of federal funds because of COVID and emergencies and things like that. And that's, uh, and it was, and now it's, it's not there anymore. Uh, so that's, those are adjustments that have to be made. And also, um, uh, there is a, an issue that was very much part of this bill, and that is to deal with uh, at least part of the very serious homelessness issue across the state of Vermont and the hotel voucher program. And I think that is settled for now uh, due to some heroic efforts, I think, on the part of a few uh, advocates for the homeless 
when the governor and others were talking about reducing the amount of money that hotels get per night, a lot of hotels were saying, well, we're not going to do this anymore. And a number of people called all of these hotels and um, got them to agree to, at least for the time being, uh, uh, accept a, a much lower uh, room rate uh, than, than they had been. So that will go ahead for a while. Uh, it's a very, very serious uh, issue, one that I actually worked on years ago when I was in state government, um, uh, and it's, it hasn't gone away. Um, in terms of issues that I've been dealing with personally, I serve on the House Environment and Energy Committee, uh, and earlier this year we put out a bill um, uh, that changes the expectations on electric utilities, basically for how much uh, renewable energy is part of their mix with the goal that it will get to 100% a bit sooner than had been previously uh, in the law. There was a lot of work put together over the summer, the summer study committee, that actually I was kind of amazed in committee when people with very diverse interests, whether it's renewable energy advocates or the Chamber of Commerce or the utilities or others, had reached a, pretty much an agreement. They had made a lot of compromises themselves and came to us with a proposal that is very much what the House uh, passed. Unfortunately, I have to say the governor, and this has been in the news just the last few days, has been making statements about how much this will cost, which are simply not true. In fact, the person who wrote the analysis that my committee had seen at the Department of Public Service has said uh, that he's pretty sure that, that that's not what, what the num numbers are. Um, and and it, the um, estimates also don't take into account as once on what's the cost. On the other, what are the financial, the monetary benefits of doing that? And there are considerable ones. So uh, that's something that I do expect um, we'll, we'll get through the legislature. Um, we'll see what the governor uh, does with it. And on the environmental side, uh, both in the committee I'm on, other committees in the House, and, and particularly also in the Senate, have been working on um, uh, bills that deal a lot with uh, restructuring of uh, Act 250 and other um, land use regulations for two purposes. One on the one side is making it easier and taking away a bunch of regulatory burdens in certain areas that can handle it to allow for more dense housing to deal with the housing issues in the state of Vermont, uh, and also to put housing in places where people uh, can walk to services and stores and things like that in, in some cases. Um, and that, that is, I think people generally agree with that. And on, on the other side is making sure we do not destroy part of the, the nature the natural environment of Vermont that actually contributes to our being able to capture and sequester or store greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and I'm talking about our forests primarily, um, to make sure that we're, uh, we're losing huge amounts, I think it's something like uh, uh, 2,000 acres a year of forest land is we're losing in Vermont, and that's because basically uh, uh, development and subdivision, not, through, not because of forestry itself. Um, and I'll just finish by saying, uh, you may be aware, uh, and our committee took testimony on some controversies around the um, uh, Agency of Natural Resources proposed uh, management plan for the Worcester Range, um, which is, uh, uh, on, the, on our side, on the east side of the range, is uh, starting from the south, Middlesex, Worcester, and Elmore. Um, on the other side is Stowe and a bit of northern Waterbury. And the, uh, I am not opposed to um, um, 
ecologically sound forestry practices, which is what they use and is actually good for the forest. Uh, the problem that I have had is some issues about the exact location that are on major waterways that come down to the north branch of the Winooski River that runs along uh, Route 12 from, starts in Elmore and ends, um, well, it ends at the Winooski River in downtown Montpelier, but it stops first at the Wrightsville Reservoir and the dam there that's right on the city line, which you may have heard, came about this close from uh, uh, spilling over its spillway for the first time since it was built in the 1930s. And if they're not careful, some of their logging will contribute uh, to more water running down the hills into the North Branch and into the, in, into the reservoir. So that's an issue that I've raised. I think I'm gonna stop there and uh, uh, see if any quick questions. Yeah, I really don't wanna take much Adam, time. Yeah. If I may, sure. I'll just introduce Saudia okay. and see if the assembly would like to hear from them and then maybe you could take a couple of questions together. Okay. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Representative Adam Pratt. And I, I just want to let folks know, we've been joined by our second representative from our district here, Saudi Lamont. And without objection, by unanimous consent, we'll invite her up to say some words as well. Okay, welcome Saudi Lamont. Can y'all hear me? Get closer. Can you hear me now? Excellent. No, closer? That good? Okay. <laughs> good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, so, Saudi Lamont from Morristown, representing you all, co signed with um, Avram. And I think he's given the rundown. I serve on the General and Housing Committee. And so, we've been focusing a lot on looking at um, plans to create sustainable housing and address the housing issues not only eminently but also in the future and so we've been hearing from uh, VHCB and VHFA community partners SASH for all our focus has been really on not only housing but support services for housing to help keep people housed. Some of the things that we have learned is that once people get into housing, it is challenging for them to sustainably remain housed. And so we're looking at, when we say upstream, we, the, we just passed um, 829 out of committee, which is a comprehensive overview of bits and pieces from other bills that we put together as a committee bill to hopefully up address upstream <coughs> eviction. Excuse me, I'm getting over the flu from, a cup from last weekend, so I apologize. Um, to address upstream eviction intervention and sustainable long-term affordable housing. We are also looking at not only affordable housing, but manufactured homes, mobile homes, and uh, home ownership. So those are some of the things that we've been talking about in, in general and housing. Also some labor issues um, around wages and uh, displaying of income, of not of incomes, of <laughs> Sorry, of pay, displaying of pay just to make it um, appropriate practice and level the playing field so that um, people are not being compensated inadequately to equal the imbalance what people are the pay range. We've also handled some discrimination stuff in our committee uh, around labor practices around uh, homelessness um, so that people cannot discriminate against people based off of their appeared status. And, um, and that people in workplaces, there's no gender inequality 
and harassment, et cetera, as well as um, a random one, which is new to folks and they didn't know about, um, which is the ability to not be fired or discriminated against based off of your hair. So, because that is a thing. And the same thing in schools where kids were being bullied in Vermont schools based off of showing up with their ethnic hairstyles and representing themselves. So, that's the General and Housing Committee. You've heard a lot of the overall from Avram. So, I just wanted to let you know what we've been working on explicitly. Um, and that I'll, I don't need to repeat, so I'll just take questions with folks um, as necessary, if that's okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would the assembly like to ask some questions? Yes, Goddard Graves. This is, I believe, my 14th town meeting, so in a sense, I'm the new kid on the block. But I know that another 14 years I won't be here. But I have a great concern about what Vermont's going to look like in 14 years. And it's my feeling that Vermont is a hell of a lot worse shape than it was in the last 14 years. I take no personal responsibility for that. If I have a, I don't want to take Roger Hill's job from him. But I'd like to look forward a few months to make a weather prediction. You're going to hear a mighty wind in November, and that will be the sound of incumbents in the legislature being blown out of office. This is not personal by two to either of you two, uh, for whom I have great respect. But there is no, I discern no sense of urgency in Montpelier about the fact that this state, and those of us who live here, are going to hell on a fast track. I absolutely believe that. I have three grand, I have six grandchildren, three of whom were facing homelessness in the last few months. Uh, all the, the four of them have jobs, are working for insultingly low wages. I hear all the time about drug problems. No, I haven't heard a single soul talk about demand reduction. What's the public sector going to do about that? Can the public do anything? Transportation, hey, I haven't heard transportation policy discussed rationally in living memory. There is no sense of urgency about the, those kinds of issues in my theater, or so I don't discern. I'm really sorry about that. So that mighty wind is going to blow a lot of incumbents out. I'm not sure who will be replacing them. Point of order. Yep. What's the question? The question is, where is the sense of urgency in my theater? End of question. Yeah, I'll go first. Yes, thank you. I'll go first. So in Montpelier, the source, the, the source of urgency has been primarily around keeping Vermonters alive and housed. That is what, a lot, if you listen to any of the debates that happen on the floor, that is primarily where things are. What, how do we keep Vermonters housed so people are not dying of exposure? And there's a lot of efforts around addiction and recovery. When you talk about workforce demand, the problem there is, and this is my personal opinion, not anything that is happening in Montpelier, I cannot speak to that, because we handle labor issues, not workforce. That is the Economic and Commerce Committee. So if you have questions explicitly there, you can check in with them, or maybe Auburn has some suggestions. But my personal opinion about workforce is not about a lack of demand. When you go anywhere in towns, people are hiring. There is a lack of ability for people to get to work. Because of the housing crisis, people are unhoused. They cannot focus on going to work when they don't know where they're going to sleep. They cannot focus on getting to work if they don't have a way to get there. And if they are using substances by chance to cope with all of this, they cannot focus on life because they are just trying to survive. And so I don't know if you all are connected to the work that I'm taking. I'm switching hats for two seconds. <laughs> because in our community, in Lamoille Valley, 
I work very closely with Lamoille Health Partners, Lamoille Housing Partnership, the United Way of Lamoille County, and this is the very work, RCT, and these are the very things that we are working on and that I do in my work back in the community on the ground level. And that is why I am in Montpelier, is to bring those issues forward because when we're in Montpelier and we're doing the work in our siloed committees, it is very challenging to decide what is the priority and who gets to decide what that priority is, right? And so each committee has its chair, each committee has its wall, Ultimately, it is up to the leadership who gets to decide which bills come off the wall to be addressed. Once that happens, that is what we work on. If it were up, if it, so it depends on, if you want something to be a priority, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to reach out to the chairs of the appropriate committees and say, hey, this bill is on your wall. This needs to be prioritized. I would love to see your committee take this up. And that is part of the legislative process and how we operate in Montpelier. Um, it's not just a matter of someone says this is a priority and we do it. We all have to apply and abide by the rules and systems in which we operate, some of which I don't agree with, some of which don't serve us because we've been doing it so long. And when you've been doing something for so long, you get the same results. And so I've only been there for two years. I'm still new. And so I don't really have a whole lot of um, pull, so to speak, or leverage. However, what I do have is voice when it's not coarse. <laughs> That's ironic in the moment. But what I can do is bring what you want forward. And when you bring something to those committees and you ask me to, hey, can you advocate and amplify this? I can speak to the colleagues in hallway and in passing. But for us to, for me to say that in, the, in Montpelier, I can do something about that. Unfortunately, that is not the way our, our process works down there. So what I am doing, and I'm only speaking for myself back in my legislative hat, and in both, I have one foot in both worlds, and that, and that is why I came, why I ran, why I wanted to serve you all, is because I see on the front lines, on the grassroots, what is happening, all of the communities that are working diligently to provide services and support and make sure you all have access to the things that you need, how do we keep them funded? How do we keep them running? And I'm trying to bridge that gap. I'm trying to bring that stuff to Montpelier and bring what we're doing in Montpelier back. And I know that's not the greatest answer, but unfortunately, that's what I've got. And maybe Avram can give you more. And I hope that was remotely helpful. I'm just, I'm just going to touch on a couple of examples. But first, I have to start by saying you had mentioned uh, the, uh, our uh, local weatherman, Roger Hill, uh, on WDV. Roger is a close neighbor and friend of mine in Worcester, so I hear from him directly, not so much on the radio. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to give a, a, a few examples. Yes, first of all, there are 180 of us legislators from all over the state and with different opinions, so finding um, uh, moving forward, finding does involve compromises, and compromises that I sometimes wish I didn't have to make. But if I didn't make them, nothing nothing would happen. But I'm going to give an example, particularly around uh, climate change. Uh, I mentioned earlier the bill um, uh, uh, that deals with the electric utilities uh, and renewable energy. Well, in fact, even today. Um, the electric utilities as a whole, and I used to uh, uh, manage one of them, are, uh, there are three utilities that are already 100% renewable. Done. Um, 
the rest of the utilities are very much moving in that direction. Um, so we've actually done a, a good job in, in that area. Where we haven't done as good a job yet is on uh, most of what we use energy for, which is transportation um, and heating. Uh, although although that is that is changing uh, as well, but we're a small state. There are not a lot of people here. We could do everything right in terms of our where our energy comes from and how we use it. We could be 100% renewable tomorrow, and that would not change climate change one bit because climate change is global. We contribute our little bit. If it was gone, we could do everything right, um, and, and the rest of the planet, uh, if, they, if they don't do the same, uh, the greenhouse gases do not respect political boundaries of states or countries. It's, it's, it's global. Um, so what we are doing and where we are actually, I think, making successes is adapting, is resilience, is making our landscape uh, adaptable and able to accept and deal with the change with less flooding, for instance. Um, to have, uh, to have uh, waterways, rather than these channels that have been dug for our rivers over the years, that when, when in, in times of high water they overflow their banks, the water needs places to go, which is what they had in nature. Uh, and if you let the beavers uh, do it, the beavers, would, <laughs> I have learned, uh, would, uh, would, would, take, would take care of that. Um, so a lot of what we are doing, and although it takes time to implement, once we say we're gonna do this, it takes time to implement, is, is uh, adapting so our communities, whether it's um, rural areas, small towns, or our downtowns in Montpelier, uh, Barrie, and elsewhere in, in the state, uh, need to learn to uh, adapt. Uh, they may need to move things in, in some of their locations. In downtown Montpelier, all of the downtown businesses are moving all of their infrastructure out of their basements. Because, because they couldn't do anything because that got flooded. So the electric infrastructure and everything else got, got flooded. They're, mo they're now uh, in, hopefully in places where that, that won't happen anymore. That all takes time. But it is, it is some of it is happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, I, I'm going to put it out to you. Would, you. would you like to ask a few more brief questions with some brief remarks before we proceed with the meeting? Yeah, and we'll, it's we'll your meeting. We'll try to be briefer, yeah. too. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Do we have a question here? Oh. Uh, Bill Con uh, Pardon me. Bill Condon. Yes. Yeah. How can you forget me? <laughs> no. I'd like to put out that I dealt with the beavers in this town of Woodbury when I was on the road crew. They're invasive. They procreate exponentially. And they will actually take out a road. I had an instance where I was called to task on Cranberry Meadow Road for removing a beaver dam because there was going to be a big storm coming. And when that storm came at the top of County Road, headed down south to, the, uh, to Cranberry Meadow Road, that water literally took out four or five beaver long dams and it washed over Cranberry Meadow Road. Now in the old days, I wasn't here then. I moved here in 1985. In the old days, before the 70s and all these, you know, oh, we can't hurt the waterways, we, everybody used to cull the rivers and get the gravel from the rivers. Just like a septic system. When you put stuff into it, it's going to rise. Now in Montpelier, if you look at the water level on a summer day by the Bailey Bridge, it's only about two feet of, of, away from the level thing. That used to be six to 10 feet lower, at least when I moved here. If they would start dredging the rivers, the water would have a place to go. That, that's the whole thing. I don't know why they don't want to dredge the rivers in the flood of, uh, what was it, uh, Irene. A, fr uh, a person I was working for had the trailer park that got inundated. On Route 12, right? Wait, 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 is there a question coming? Sorry to interrupt. 
I'm, I'm trying to ask him why they don't take, he's, he's talking about flooding, and I'm talking about, well, the water needs some place to go, and it can't go if the river keeps rising all the time. It's just like here. So Bill, Bill the question, why do we no longer dredge? Yeah, so why don't we dredge to, anymore? Why, that don't take, you don't need to move deeper. buildings, you could dredge yeah. the river. Okay, let's see. I'll be brief, but I have heard very different uh, information and testimony uh, of, of, about these issues, which is dredging works in the place where you dredge, and it hits everybody downstream. Well, then you gotta keep going. Um, what is needed now that we are in fact getting so much more rain than we did 10 years ago, for instance, even, um, we need to, in addition to constructed um, uh, methods, and, and there is always a conflict in, in, in lots of towns between the beavers and the roads, there's, there's, no, there's no question about that, but we need to find ways to let the landscape absorb much more water like it used to um, during, times of, during times of high water. Otherwise, it's, it's all just going into this narrow, narrow path that's dredged, moving even faster than it was, and if it doesn't flood where it used to, it's gonna flood uh, in the next town down. I would like to just rebut his statement. Well, before we do that, we're going to give others a, a chance to make a comment or question. Briefly, Mr. Jonah Meech. Um, I'm not sure if you're all aware of what's going on with the elementary schools in our district right now, but one of our schools has lower attendance in Lakeview, and there is a move in Hardwick to close it. And I don't believe that the intention of the state when we were forced into a unified district was to close all the smaller schools. And so my question is, now that there, have been law, that there has been an adjustment to the law to make it harder for schools to go out on their own, is there any move in Montpelier to adjust how the smaller schools may or may not be closed so that we're not voting against a larger town to close the school in our town, which affects this town's community and property values. Saudi or Avram? I'll jump in. Sorry. No worries. Okay. So I was just having a conversation with some colleagues about this yesterday because I too am trying to understand this. And what it was brought to what my understanding is, is that when the, I think this has to do with the pupil waiting and the, the um, Act 127 and all of those things that were intended to help um, the education funding, but what we didn't factor in was the federal monies that were coming in. Unfortunately, because I think it's a state, it is a state budget, and so when we are looking at that, they are looking at all of the school districts around the state. And so how do we not impact the rural and smaller communities? That question was just raised. I don't know that there is an answer. I know that at um, age 50 was just passed with some, you know, uh, abatement measures to try to help rectify funding. However, back to the employment and workforce, with a lack of educators and a lack of staff, the amount of money that it costs to keep uh, peripheral schools up and functioning with the staffing and educators and everything else is very high. And so we're looking at, or not we, because not my committee, but from what my understanding is, is they are looking at ways to improve the student to teacher ratio without, I don't know without, I don't wanna say that, but to try and mitigate the impact in rural areas, but there are bigger cities um, that have schools 
within five minutes of each other. Someone was just saying yesterday. Um, I think it was like Rutland City or something like that. And I think when you make state, state decisions with the intention of benefiting the majority, folks get left behind. And so I am not certain in our rural area about how to, how to negate that, but what I do understand is that some issues can be done on a municipal level, and I don't know if those things will translate, the things that are happening in Montpelier, how the new, as the education committee is working on these things, and uh, the other committees are working on these things, how that will translate here, because there are so many things that are currently up in the air, they're not defined yet. And so I would be remiss to give you an, a, a definitive answer from my understanding right now, and I'll defer to, to Avram and see if he has more information than I, but that was the conversation that we were literally just having yesterday, is trying to figure these things out, and we didn't have any answers. It was, that was actually my second conversation around these things as I'm trying to learn about these issues. So, I'll let you, if he has, he'll probably have more than I do. Sorry. Up and down, short and tall. This is a tough issue, and one of the things that is driving it that is not going to go away is declining student numbers. Um, in, and, and that affects uh, small schools. At a, at a certain point, people are confronted unfortunately with having to think, does this, does this make sense? I'm thinking of a few locations. Um, one of the, I often say one of the, maybe the best job I ever had was in the mid-1970s when I lived in South Woodbury and I was the one full-time school bus driver for the Cabot School District. Um, I still have one of my uniform shirts from, 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 that, from that day. Um, at that time, uh, Cabot High School graduating class was all of maybe a dozen, 14 people. This year, it's four. So at a certain point, Cabot is now considering whether the high school, not the elementary school, um, uh, whether the high school students should go to Twinfield, which is actually quite close by. That would be unfortunate on the one hand, on the other hand, it might, it might make sense. Other schools in the central Vermont area, you may have read about, uh, uh, for whatever reasons, during the mergers, um, the Montpelier and Roxbury school districts merged, and now there's uh, same issue with declining revenue in Roxbury, and what are they going to do about that? Are they going to bust them? Uh, to Montpelier. So these are, um, these, are, these are tough issues. The Washington Central District that Worcester is part of um, is uh, considering some reorganizations of how they do things, not necessarily closing a school. Uh, but it, this has been considered before. Rumney School in Middlesex, when they built that school, they built it almost on the Worcester town line. It's closer to most of Worcester than it is to most Middlesex residents. Um, could you do some grades in one building and other grades in another uh, and, and save on teacher costs that way? You, you, could do, you could serve both towns with one teacher in the fourth grade, as an, as an example, rather than two. Um, so those are things that towns have to confront, but what is driving this that's not going away is that they're, they're in a lot of our schools, and especially the visible in, in the smaller schools, there are, there are a lot less students, and, and, and we need to figure out ways to do that, knowing how important a school is to a small town, not just as an educational resource, but the building itself. Um, uh, uh, we're in one, uh, so th those are uh, th those are it's very 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 difficult issues. But but in some places, I think the Washington Central uh, board right now is trying to find ways uh, to not close things down, but to do things differently um, that make sense and that. 
that keep things open. You don't have to keep doing that. You don't have to keep doing that. I remembered one thing, a very important factor. The Agency of Education has been without leadership for the past year. So there has been no director of the Agency of Education, that space has been vacant and continues to be vacant for the past year. And so it is very challenging for us to advocate and do things when there is no leadership at the Agency of Education that is responsible for all of these things. So I just wanted, I, I was like, wait a minute, I forgot the most important thing. So I just wanted to just put that. Yes, on uh, Pelts. Thank you. Yes, Stephen, on a Pelts. I'm one of the four um, school board representatives who earlier in the meeting sought to address the assembly with a few updates about what's happening both at our elementary level and our high school level. Um, and if we have an opportunity to do that um, with your presence um, to, to continue this conversation. I'll, I'll address that here because we, we deferred earlier um, uh, a recognition of one of our school board members under uh, Article 2. Um, and now we'll ask without objection by unanimous consent our school officials will direct some questions and remarks to our representatives. Okay. So here's. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, I'll, I'll stand up with uh, Darren Yashidowitz as the other Mountain View Union representative that is here today. Um, yeah. Gee, okay, we can, yeah. All the way to the front. Come on, come on down. Here. Here, we go. here we go. Here we go. Thank you. Um, great. I just, I just want to start by saying a huge thank you. Um, both of you for the work that you do. I've had a very small taste of what it's like to be in the hot seat on some of these big issues. Um, so thank you so much for, for wrangling all of these big, big questions on so many levels. Um, so what we were just talking about is really relevant to the Mountain View School District right now. Um, as some of you may know, we are in the middle of the, the three um, schools and four towns that are represented in Mountain View are in the middle of uh, an extensive process looking at campus configuration and how our district can use its resources to the best extent possible to support the education of all of our children at the elementary level with all of these questions and considerations that are just being discussed, right? Enrollment issues, staffing issues, facilities upkeep, budget, in incredible changes to um, education finance, right? So we're, we're grappling with a lot of different questions that all relate and frankly have no simple answer. Um, so one thing I just want to make a note of, well, a couple things. I brought our annual report for the elementary district as well as a frequently asked questions document that the board has prepared about all of the different aspects of, of the issue um, right now, which is specifically around the Lakeview School, as Jonah referenced in his question to our representatives. Right now, we are looking at <clears throat> staffing and enrollment issues, challenges at the Lakeview School, Historically, our student enrollment has been volatile, right? So if we look at enrollment trends dating back over the last 20 years, which our board has done, the numbers are all over the map. And that is just indicative of how population changes and housing changes um, occur in our state. And it's, you know, it, it, it um, not only has to do with the housing issues and other bigger issues which are outside the purview of the school board, but I think it has to do with how we create conditions so that our schools can maintain um, their viability as the hearts of our small communities. And I think as someone who recently moved here, 
from a city and, and looking at how we can attract more young families to our small towns, the quality and viability of our schools is among the primary questions that many young families are asking when they decide where to move. And so I just want to say that I don't have the answers, as, as Saudia said, as Avram said. You know, these are big questions with a lot of complex considerations. Our board right now is opening those questions, is asking our community to become involved in the conversations that are required for us to come to the answers together, right? Um, but what we maintain our focus on is to, to find a way to maintain the health and quality of our communities through our schools and ultimately to be able to create conditions for all of our students to succeed and thrive. So all of that is sort of um, referenced in these documents which are on the far back table. I will be here at the end of the meeting as well if anyone would like to talk about, you know, there are a lot of questions about the budget. I do want to just say briefly that a number of districts, oh, many districts across the state have had to rethink their budgets entirely because of the education finance changes that are happening so rapidly. Fortunately, our district is not one whose budget was impacted dramatically by these changes. We had a sound budget. We were under the 5% cap. We didn't have a lot of excessive or additional, you know, sort of spending written into our budget. And so you may vote as you will next Tuesday on the budget, but our board is very much in support of our budget. It's a sound budget and we are, you know, are, are proud to put it in front of you. Um, you know, despite the fact that taxes are going up, which is a reality for all of us, primarily because of the changes this year to the common level of appraisal. And I think we can talk about that more later. But I'll be in the back after the meeting, and I'll give Darren a chance to talk to you. Yeah. So I, I mostly, um, I mostly uh, just wanted to mention and remind, hopefully everybody knows, that there is an advisory vote on Tuesday, along with the budget, about essentially our town's feeling, and it would be the whole district's feeling because all our votes get mixed together and counted as a whole, on whether or not to keep Lakeview campus open for instruction. Um, that is purely an advisory vote for the board to kind of gauge where the community as a whole within the district stands. So you vote yes, it remains open. You vote no, it's, you're saying you think it should be closed. Um, as Anna said, I think we have a really strong budget. Uh, this is my first year, so I might be a little naive to that, but um, I do feel like we've kept expenses increasing only really where necessary, and the big expense that I see as an increase in that budget is offering universal uh, pre-K for the district, which, again, is an amazing way to attract young families and to offer that in a way that would make life, I think, easier, having a kid who's almost there, um, to, to live in a community and work with everybody else. Um, I did see a hand or two, but I'm, I, I feel like for, for everybody's time, I'm gonna let other people speak. <laughs> yeah. If, if I may, we, we can see if there are any other comments, and then we can take some questions as you wish. Do you want to take the questions first, and then Chris and I can you start? Want, okay, okay. Uh, first, I'll recognize, yes, Greta Dunlap. I think we all for coming and for being and talking, but we got all about town business to get through to today, and I need to get home. <laughs> so if, if we need this kind of talking meeting, maybe we need to plan one and attend it and ask questions. Okay. Okay. I will, I will ask if there's anyone else that hasn't spoken yet that wishes to during this period. And okay. There's Are a there question any? in the back. Yes, yeah, yep. Yeah. We have we have John Amici who would like to speak on the second time. I just Anna, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question because you mentioned something about the taxes going up. And uh, I wanted to ask a question that e even if we were to vote down the budget on Tuesday here, it would not have a direct impact 
on our taxes because that is all determined at the state level, not based on our local school board budget. Is that true? Thanks, Jonah. Yeah, so briefly, um, the way I understand it is that each town has their property taxes that go into a big pot of money that goes to Montpelier, and that money is divided up among school districts across the state, right? So there is no, as there was in the past, I know some of you may remember, it used to be done differently, but now there's no direct input and output in terms of our tax money from local towns. It's not a direct correlation, like I put X amount in, and that same X amount is going to my school, right? So there are a lot of levers that are being pulled in different directions, and they're not always correlated in terms of how our taxes are going in and how the money is coming back to us. I will say, as a rural town, because of the equalized pupil and some of the other um, equity-based changes that the state has made to the budgets, our communities are benefiting from that. So, um, as Jonas said, yes, we could, you know, the board, if the budget is voted down, if the board slashes a bunch of um, spending, right, um, it would not necessarily have a direct impact on whether or not your taxes go up or down because there are a lot of other factors. Okay. Um, are there any comments from our Hazen representatives? Yes. I'd like to give a, a lightning tour, just a few minutes, for, of the uh, what's happening on the ground with respect to what you've been hearing. Uh, some of you here I recognize. We used to vote the school budget locally. We raised the money locally. We paid this local school. Louder? So it's, it's different now. We all pay property taxes. The, the money goes from every town to Montpelier, and the state decides uh, how to distribute the money. The money is chiefly distributed based on the number of pupils in the school. And there's an adjustment to that number. It's, it's per pupil funding. So it costs more to educate some students than others. It's just a fact of life. So in past years, there has been a special weight assigned to certain students. So uh, some student may be, after the weighting, worth 1.2 students, right? And the list of students is, is reviewed, and the, the weighted uh, assignments are assigned. Now, for Hazen, there are about 300, close to 300 physical bodies, students in the school. After the old weighting, the number for purposes of funding was 323 students. With Act 27, based on a, a study of, of how fair and realistic the waiting system was. There was a whole new waiting system put in place. Uh, for Hazen, the number of weighted students is now 500, just over 500, which means that it, it costs a lot to educate the students at Hazen. So, that's where we get our, our funding, it's per student. So we get more funding. The result was this year for Hazen, and I have the figures for uh, the elementary school too, that after the, the increased spending at Hazen, with a new waiting formula, and anticipating the amount that the town would get, that the Hazen Union would get. The, after you figure out the, the education budget, the property tax went down two cents from last year. It went down. 
And partly that's because uh, uh, how, how did it jump from 323 weighted students to 501? Uh, we depended on uh, parents to give information about their um, status with regard to uh, state services. Sometimes that information was hard to come by, could be many reasons. Uh, but now, this year, the state has sent us that information directly, and we can make the uh, weighting adjustments uh, with better information. So, for, for Hazen, for Hazen, it, it went down uh, three cents. For the elementary school, it went down two cents, down from last year. So why are taxes going up this year? So let's leave the school budget aside for a minute. It's, it's been fixed, and we know where it stands with regard to the property tax posture compared to last year. There is a measure called common level of appraisal. Uh, we're all appraised on a, 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 our homes and we pay property taxes based on the value of the real estate we have. Over the past uh, three years, um, there has been an influx, th there's been a hot rise in the property market. Who knows why, maybe people wanting to get out of the cities with COVID, remote learning, cheap property in Vermont compared to everywhere else on the planet, perhaps. But, but the money poured in, so the market value, the statistical market value went up. The result is that the appraisals throughout the town net out at I think just barely under 70% of what's 100% of market value based on actual sales. So then the state, for every town, adjusts the property tax to fill the gap, right? If you're appraised for 60%, everybody's got to be appraised at 100%. So the state makes a mathematical adjustment result of that adjustment, the uh, preliminary tax is this. Mountain View goes up 13 cents. So the common level of appraisal, money pouring into the real estate market, wiped out the two cent savings and went up to 13 cents. For Hazen, the three cent savings was wiped out, and the preliminary figures are there'll be a nine cent increase on the education tax rate for Hazen. About three quarters of the people in this town are going to have that effect moderated because there's a cap on the amount of taxes that are paid by an individual. Uh, based on your income, you get some, the state will pay part of your uh, property tax. So uh, as far as the impact of those increases, they're gonna be moderated, depends on how much you earn. I think the level was, um, it, don't quote me on this, like 128,000, was a cutoff point. If you make less than that, the state steps in and pays part of your tax. So that's that's the quick tax picture. Tax picture. There, there are some other uh, interesting issues that come up, and this will be really fast. Uh, in, in terms of <laughs> it's my second line today. So. But there's some other issues that, that interact with the school. One is uh, housing. I, I just want to say that we've had some good teachers, and we've offered good teachers positions at Hazen. They had to turn it down because they couldn't find housing. Um, in terms of uh, 
substance abuse. Uh, you know, sometimes it, it's not worth waiting for somebody outside uh, to come help you. So there's been an effort, a coordinated effort. Uh, you may have heard from one of our representatives about uh, Healthy Lamoille helping out in this. Um, in the principal's office the other day, he pulled open a drawer and it was the best collection of vaping devices I've ever seen. They're in there. So they're being confiscated. Some of the students are even getting tickets from the police department. Vaping has gone down at the school. Um, and, and finally, uh, in terms of uh, academics, um, we have in our budget, in the Hazen budget, uh, hiring uh, for reading and math interventionists and to, to change a guidance counselor position from uh, half-time to full-time. Uh, that's where those efforts are needed. So that's a quick tour, and uh, as, as Anna mentioned, uh, we'll be around after the meeting or later to <coughs> any other questions you might have. Thank you. So, I'm going to conclude to offer Chris Casey. No, no comments there. Our school representatives will be available for questions after the meeting. Um, and I sense it's time to proceed with the meeting. With that, I would just like to first ask our representatives, last year you made yourselves available by providing information and phone numbers. Would you be willing to do that now, just so if anyone here has outstanding questions now or through the year, they could contact you? Okay, I'm going to take this down too, so if you don't get it from your seats, uh, you could ask me later, okay? Contact information, please. Okay, first of all, as I said earlier, each one of us, every legislator has their own page on the legislative website, and that is all, all there. Some people are more comfortable cruising around the internet than others, uh, but it is there. But um, our legislative email addresses uh, follow the same formula, first, let, first letter of the first name followed by the last name. So mine is A-P-A-T-T -T at ledge, L-E-G, state, period, V-T, period, U-S. Okay, and again, it's on on the website. My phone number is is uh, is uh, also there, and there's also ways you'll you'll see if you go there. If we're at the state house all week and and you want to get a hold of us, you can uh, leave a message for us, and one of the student pages will hand deliver a note. Uh, whether it's just call me or whether you want to uh, bend our ear about an issue that's bothering you or that you are supportive of. Pardon me, just for a sec. Do you have the phone number? Yeah. On the, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or thank you. Or not? Not for the state house, yeah. but our personal. Our. Oh, I'll give my personal number. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say our personal number's on here. So I didn't have enough time to gather an, um, enough copies. Um, however, I do have. I just wanted you to leave you all on the desk. I'll leave some. Uh, two copies that for y'all to glance at and if you want our numbers are on the back our contact information and so mine is also s lamont at ledge dot state dot vt dot us i'll give you another email if you're writing this down and that is lamont for vermont at gmail dot com so feel free to use either of those the phone number if you would like to write that down is 802-335-2334. If I do not answer, because I cannot all the time, please leave a message. And if you do not leave a message, if you can text, leave a message or text and with your name and the issue so I can get back to you. 
okay? And I'll leave these and some business cards on the table back there, okay? Thank you. Um, I, I should also mention that um, I have a website. It's uh, it's easy to remember my name, A V R A M P A T T dot com. All my contact information is is there as well. But my home phone number, uh, old fashioned landline, is eight zero two. 223-1014. Thank you to our representatives and to our assembly, Alvin Khan and Sadia Lamar. Okay, we're still in business. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, folks. We could proceed with the plan to have lunch soon. So, uh, yes. Um, here's what I propose that we move through the remainder of Article 3, the election of officers, and then we'll take a break at your pleasure for 20 to 30 minutes to have lunch. Take a recess and then we'll come back. Any objections? Okay. Let us proceed. So, we've elected a select board member. We have elected a lister. That brings us to the next position up for election, auditor for a period of three years. Are there any nominations for auditor? Yes, Alex Pelt. I nominate Jonah Meacham. Okay, Jonah Me second, okay. Jonah Meacham is nominated and seconded. I saw a hand up in the back. Nope, I was seconded. Okay, thirded. Um, are there other nominations for the position of auditor. Okay. Seeing, hearing, none. Without objection, by unanimous consent, we will close nominations for auditor. This is a position that must be elected by ballot. Is there a motion to direct the clerk to cast one ballot for Jonah Meacham for the position of Auditor. Moved by Darren Yusinowitz, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second, Michael Sadler, thank you. All those in favor of directing the clerk to cast one ballot for Jonah Meacham for the position of auditor for three years, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Jonah, uh, can you tell me who seconded that? Brandy. Brandy? Well, actually, Brandy third of it, I think. Somebody else seconded it. John Riley. John Riley? John Riley. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Good oh, pardon me. Pardon me. Pause here for a moment so that we can move correctly forward. In, in my recollection, the, the nomination was made by Alex Peltz, which is sufficient which is sufficient. A second is not required, but for the record, I believe I recognize Darren Yusinowitz, who seconded the nomination, for the record. Okay, so we conducted the vote. The ayes do have it, which means the clerk will, will cast one ballot for Jonah Meacham for the position of auditor for three years. Okay, the next position. Um, yes, yes. Jeremy Meacham. The next position up for election is the collector of delinquent taxes for a term of one year. Are there any nominations? Yes, Amy Eldred, yes. Brady Smith. 
Okay, Brandy Smith is nominated. Second. Se okay, seconded by Jonah Meacham. Are there any other nominations for the collector of delinquent taxes? Hearing none, without objection, by unanimous consent, we will close nominations. This position is, does not require a ballot vote, so we'll say our nominee is Brandy Smith. All those in favor of electing Brandy Smith as the collector of delinquent taxes, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Brandy Smith is elected collector of delinquent taxes. Thank you, Brandy. The next position up for election is cemetery commissioner for a period of five years. Are there nominees? Yes, Patty Garbeck. Patty Garbeck nomina nominates Stephanie Appleton. Are there any other nominations? No. Yeah. I seconded. <laughs> seconded by Myrna Miranda O'Neill. Okay. Are there any other nominations for cemetery commissioner? <laughs> Hearing none, without objection, and by unanimous consent, we'll close nominations. We have a nomination for Stephanie Appleton to be elected cemetery commissioner for a term of five years. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Stephanie Appleton is elected cemetery commissioner for a period of five years. Is Stephanie here? Would she like to? Okay, she's not here. That's fine. <laughs> okay. The next. Okay. We have we have three positions remaining. They are all for the position of library trustee. However, there are three, three positions, and the three terms are three years, second position for three years, and a third position for two years. I just wanted to clarify that at the outset here. So the next election is for library trustee for a period of three years. Are there any nominations? Yes, Myr Myrna Miranda O'Neill. Okay, we have a, a nomination for Alicia Rainey. Second. Jo okay, seconded by Jonah Meacham. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, without objection, and by unanimous consent, we will close nominations. Our nominee is Alicia Rainey for the position of library trustee for a term of three years. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Alicia Rennie is elected library trustee for a period of three years. <laughs> Alicia, would, would you like to just stand? Here's Alicia. <laughs> The next, the next position up for election is that of library trustee for a period of three years. Are there nominations? I saw here, Robin Durkee. I nominate Dee Dee Slayton Avery. Dee Dee Slayton Avery is nominated. Yes? Uh, I'm just waiting. Oh, would you like to just stand and just. Here, here. Here's Dee Dee. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other nominations for library trustee for a term of three years? Hearing none, without objection and by unanimous consent, we'll close nominations. Our nominee and candidate is 
Dee Dee Slayton Avery for library trustee for a period of three years. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Dee Dee Slayton Avery is elected library tr trustee for a period of three years. And our final position up for election under Article 3 is for library trustee for a term of two years. I have one. Are there nominations? Diana Paduzzi. I'd like to nominate Chris Codius. Chris Codius is nominated. Chris, would you like to stand? <laughs> there he is. Are there other nominations for library trustee for a period of two years? Hearing none, without objection and by unanimous consent, we will close nominations. We have Chris Codius nominated for library trustee for a period of two years. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Chris Codius is elected library trustee for a period of two years. Thank you to all of our nominees and elected officials. Thank you. That concludes Article 3. Without objection by unanimous consent, we will recess the meeting until 12.30. And I would like to make an announcement. Well, hearing, hearing no objections, we will recess. And you may have lunch or not, but we'd like to just announce the lunch that's presented here for us. Would, would yeah, would yeah, someone thanks, here? Steve. Yeah, this is um, a fundraiser for our friends of the Woodbury Elementary School. So we do a lot of things here uh, with the teachers and the kiddos. So that's what this is for. Thanks. Friends of Woodbury Elementary School. So, thank you. Please come up and have lunch, and we'll see you back here at 12:30. Folks. <laughs> All right. We we're nearly nearly through recess. So, with that. Uh, <laughs> with that, we will call the meeting back to order, resume the meeting. I hope everyone enjoyed the lunch. Thank you very much again to friends of WES. All right. Okay. Okay. So, we, we left off, having concluded Article 3 in the election of our officers, that brings us to Article 4. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 4? Okay. Thank you. Moved by Steve Fryhoffner. Is there a second? Oh, uh, I saw Ellie Hayes second first. That's okay. Second first. Thank you. So we have it. We have it moved and seconded. I will read the article and then we'll move on to discussion. Article four. <clears throat> Shall the town have its taxes paid to the town treasurer as tax receiver, sixty days after tax bills are mailed? Estimated due date to be October 24th, 2024, question mark. Taxes would then become delinquent and be turned over to the collector of delinquent taxes for collection with a penalty that increases by one half percent per month of delinquency to a maximum of 6% for one full year or more of delinquency and interest of 6% per year or one half percent
per month. Is there any discussion? Yes, I recognize you. Could you state your name, please? Yeah, I'm Sean Fielder. Sean Fielder. that's a problem. I don't think that's an issue for us, but I just want to make sure that hey, if we have a problem with this mail service moving forward and 60 days isn't adequate enough time, is that a logistical problem? Without objection, I'll, I'll ask our clerk or treasurer or another town official to answer on it. Brandy? Brandy Smith, our town treasurer. Any other discussion on Article 4? Okay, hearing none, we will move to the vote. <clears throat> Article 4, a vote for yes would be to approve Article 4, vote no. No. It's that simple. So, all those in favor of Article 4, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Article 4 is passed. Article 5. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 5? So moved. Moved by Chris Codius. Is there a second? Seconded by Paul Cerruti. Article 5 has been moved and seconded. I'll state the article before consideration. Article 5. Shall the voters appropriate $19,850 for the support of the Woodbury Community Library? Is there any discussion on Article 5? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of passing Article 5, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Article 5 is passed. Our next article, Article 6. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 6? So moved. Okay. Moved by Ellie Hayes. Is there a second? <laughs> Angela Grace seconds. Okay. Article is moved and seconded. I uh, will read Article 6. <clears throat> Shall the voters appropriate $13,000 for the support of the Woodbury cemeteries? Is there any discussion? Yeah, oh. Yes, please. Yep, yeah, I'll recognize you. Would, would you state your name? D. Dazine. D. Dazine. D. Dazine. Thank you. Yes? Okay. D. Dazine would like to know how is the be money being used uh, for the Woodbury cemeteries? Correct. Yep. Is there, is there someone here from the cemetery can, that could? Okay, I, I recognize Amy, Amy Eldred. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mowing repairs and a new road into the green burial in the cemetery in South Woodbury. Yep, green burial site, yes. Yep, I recognize Lucinda Smith. Of 
some some of the cleanup uh, the costs are attributed to cleanup from tree blowdowns in the cemeteries. Yep. Are the, yep. Yep. Any other any other comments or debate under Article Six? Okay. Hearing none, we'll proceed to the vote. All those in favor of passing Article 6, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Article 6 is passed. Article 7. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 7? Okay, moved by Skip Marcassani. Is there a second? Yep. Seconded by Jonah Meacham. Okay. Article 7 is moved and seconded. I'll state the article. Shall the voters appropriate $17,850 to the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department to be added to the truck replacement fund paid July 1st 2024. Is there any discussion on Article 7? Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed to the vote. All those in favor of passing Article 7, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Article 7 is passed. Article 8. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 8? Yes, David, David Morse moves, moves Article 8. Is there a second? Yep. Sarah, Sarah Van Hoff seconds Article 8. It's moved and seconded. I will read Article 8. Shall the voters appropriate $123,515.73 to fund the operations of the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department? The capital replacement fund paid in full by January 1st, 2025 in the amount of $32,000 and the operating expenses of $91,515.73 paid in quarterly installments of $22,000 $878.93 starting July 1st, 2024. Is there a discussion on Article 8? Yes, I recognize Paul, Paul Cerruti. Yep. Would, would you like to start this one? It might be loud enough. But. Okay. So we had I feel like I'm looking over a truck. So we had a nice conversation the other night uh, at the pre-town meeting, and uh, some felt that I should probably share kind of what's going on in the community and what we're facing with the current crises that are going on in the state. Um, we kind of keep it to ourselves because it's what we do in the emergency services world, but I wanted to make sure everyone kind of understands the pressure that the fire departments and rescue service is under right now. The last six months of 2023 was unbelievably busy, uh, initially starting with the flood, but then the call volume went up to 22 or three, four calls a month, which we averaged 10 prior to that. Um, and our real downslide in, in problem areas started about 2018. And if you remember, we had a double homicide in this town where we arrived at a house that was on fire um, and about a half an hour into that incident, my son walked up to me and said, Dad, I think the house next door is on fire too. 
and we were in the middle of nowhere. I walked across this field and I stood in front of a picture window, which then fell in my face and flames shot out. We then had to quickly split our forces and deal with this fire. Uh, immediately sent crews inside uh, who said, Chief, there's a body in the kitchen. Um, I crawled in and the body had been shot. So I knew we had an issue and in the second home I immediately sent another crew in and we found another body. So we found ourselves in the middle of the number one issue we're having right now is the addiction or opiate crisis. Um, and that has gotten worse and worse over the last few years and it's kind of, I, I, I don't want to say culminated because there's plenty of room for growth in this, but in the last uh, few years it, we've seen a steady, steady increase in the use of illicit drugs in the community and the associated problems that come with that. It's a common, almost weekly occurrence for me to be going somewhere to wake someone up in their car, Narcanning somebody, um, which we don't do as much because a lot of folks just wake up, or in the last few weeks, at least four people dead uh, that we've had to deal with. One individual froze to death. Uh, other places I've worked, people dying or being very sick from carbon monoxide poisoning from sitting in their car. Um, having their addiction issues. So uh, to go with that is the crime that we're facing. Uh, in one week, we had the same individual in three different car crashes, um, one, at one point carrying over 100 bags of heroin with them. And we're dealing with issues of open, uncapped needles in their persons, uh, foil packets that have fentanyl residue on them that if you're not careful with how you handle this, you will be overdosing. We probably read those stories. Um, we've had some shootings. Uh, there was a shooting just a couple months ago where uh, because we have no police protection in town, I had to make the decision where we're supposed to make, you know, the, the joke for EMT classes, BSI, body substance isolation is the scene safe, right? So you put on your gloves and your mask and then is the scene safe? Well, unfortunately in our town, many times when we go, the scene is not safe. And you're left with a choice of do I go help my friend who they're at her house in the driveway with two Crip gang members, one of which is shot, and leave them to themselves, or do I just approach the scene? Which is what we decided to do, and you're having to deal with some pretty hardened folks that are not interested in talking. Um, we're having folks that are getting uh, another instance where someone was beat up, broken bones, thrown in the ditch. And our call is someone screaming for help at two o'clock in the morning. This has become more the rule now, these type of calls, uh, picking up the same inebriated individuals multiple times in the same week, uh, having car crashes, for example, uh, crashing their cars, and, and they get arrested. And what I found out arrested means is you get a summons, and they're just in the car the next day. So, so those are the kind of pressures we're under. Um, uh, fires and, and fire calls has stayed fairly steady, but uh, due to homelessness, uh, the addiction crisis, and frankly, we're all getting older. I'm closer to 60 than I am to, to 50 anymore, so, um, and that's young compared to other folks, but um, a lot of folks, for a number of reasons, are, are staying home. So that's why you see the driving upward increase in a lot of, we deal with a lot of just sick people. You know, they get older and, and they get sick, and so that's what we're doing, and I just wanted to kind of explain, those are the things driving budget increases, you know, we're into inflation like everybody else, but you know, we've done all we could controlling the cost. When you got these calls going up, 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 you just kind of, we're kind of addressing that issue. I don't know what the fix is, but we've been meeting with the select board monthly, and I think that's a good thing to continue. Um, and, I, and I have been remiss in not getting this information out to folks, so they kind of understand what's going on. There's a lot of pressure on this service. <laughs> And it's been, frankly, super challenging since our building was destroyed to perform these services. So, I mean, we, you go on a call, you get covered with bloody, bloody, bloody body fluids from someone else, and you're parking the truck in the parking lot and going into the firehouse to get the key to go in the town hall to go in the, you know. So this is the stuff we're trying to deal with. So I just wanted to bring that up. And, and, and the, I was trying to be as gentle with it, but some of these calls are really awful, dealing with the death we're having to deal with. So we're also having to stay on top of our members' mental health because, you know, telling someone their family member is dead or dealing with the, the, it's not just a perceived threat. These people are dangerous. Some of the people came to town to shoot somebody. That was what they came to do, and someone shot them before they got shot. So that's what we're dealing with. Um, 
uh, I hate to call it, but big city problems in a small town. And, and again, my view on that is we don't have police protection and so people can just do their thing. It's normal for us in the, in the middle of the night to be out on a call and you see all the nefarious activities going on. I've had to shoot people out of the road. Can you please not deal heroin in the middle of Greenwood Lake Road so I can get to the fire call, for example. And you come home and they're parked in the end of your driveway. So that's that. So any questions about that? Did I cover it well enough? <laughs> not to have an undelicate topic after dinner. Well, without objection by unanimous consent, we can have an exchange of questions and comments and keep Paul here. He can, he can answer them in turn. Okay, first, uh, yes, I, I, I saw this gentleman first. We'll, we'll recognize as we go around. Could you please state your name? My name is Rob Gildner. Rob Gildner. Rob Gildner. 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 Uh, are you saying that these kind of crimes are happening here in Woodbury? I must be in the Yeah, this is all happening right here. Yes. Yeah. 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 I see it. It's, it's, it's a, oh, hold on, hold on. One at a time, yeah, please. So, question, is it, is it happening in Woodbury, Paul? Yes. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I had one day, I want to say it was two weeks ago, where someone called me, there was a car stopped up here by the mill dam, and I pulled up, they're injecting heroin, I asked them if they, typically I'll try to ask them if you want some help, I carry lead behind kits, and, and, and I, my goal is to try to talk to folks and see, because again, many of the folks I talk to don't want to be addicts, and their lives has been encompassed by the addiction, um, and it, my goal is to get them to some help because the problems that are, we're all facing from this is only going to be fixed by their recovery. That's just the way it is and we've got to stop people getting addicted. That's a different problem. But in that one day I did that, we had a fatality from heroin overdose and then we had someone freeze to death. Um, so, so those are kind of things going on. Is this, is this every day, every week? No, but they're... When a bad batch of heroin comes to town, you can almost, it happens in all the communities, it's like, well, four overdoses today. So that's kind of what's happening. And then that other nefarious activity that's going on is, it's hit and miss, it's where it is, uh, the, the hot spots of the town clerk's office, the fishing accesses, the water tub. Um, yeah, it's just, you see those cars parked there all night long, and I mean, the other night, or last night, uh, came by and they'd been coming and going from the Greenwood Lake fishing axe as you could see that almost worn a groove in the pavement so that's what's going on okay I recognize next Susan Martin thank you um, recently the Department of Health has uh, sent a notice to towns uh, maybe not this town but uh, about having a safe house where people can go and relieve themselves a temporary So, so, want me to answer? Sorry. Yes, please. So, yeah, I, I have that. absolutely no experience with that. Um, someone asked me the question, my view on safe injection sites. I guess that's kind of the, I don't know the answer to that. My, my guidance to others would be to look at the areas that have done it and look at the stats and see if it made any difference. That would be my first approach. Uh, I can tell you anecdotally, having dealt with lots of folks, uh, most will have a short conversation with you and then just want to go. So I don't know if they'd use those services or not. I think uh, any group that could make us more aware and, and maybe collectively approach the powers that be with policing and whatnot would be a valuable thing. Because others have encouraged me to speak up and I'm reluctant to because it involves people's personal lives and, and frankly things that a lot of times we don't really want to talk about. Um, but that, 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 you know, in like any uh, society there's always that. It's not very far from a collective good society to things falling apart very quickly under the surface. And a lot of times we don't really want to see that part but I think it would be helpful to just experience it and see that it's there and we can act accordingly. I Next hand up I saw it was Patrick Flood. So I just want to say thank you. Sure. I was unaware 
uh, just how bad the situation was. I mean, I think we all know drugs are a problem in the state and overdoses are a problem in the state. I did not realize the extent of the burden that that was putting on you. We have a volunteer fire department here trying to deal with these issues. I think that's heroic, actually. We'll get around to the, the next the next uh, next recognition is Goddard Graves. Yes. Quick question, Paul. I'm, I'm not suggesting that I think you're kicking the can down the street because I know you don't. When you say approach the powers that be, what what are you trying to explain? Who are these powers beyond? I, I don't you? really know the answer to that. What, what tends to happen with, with problems that are out of sight? If you want an interesting book to read, it was written in the 70s by a man named David uh, Dennis Smith, who was the author and uh, lead person of Firehouse Magazine. But it was a book called Report from Engine Company 82. And if anyone remembers what New York City and the South Bronx was like in the early 70s, he wrote about the fire department being the kind of end-all position for the social strife and problems that were going on at the time. And he wrote clearly, said, the, the, the structures of society have broken down to the point where if I call my building superintendent, he's not going to come. If I call the police, they're not going to come. If I call social services, they're not going to come. But if I go out in the front of the building and I pull that red alarm box, the fire truck shows up. So they were getting called to broken water pipes and somebody's beating their girlfriend. And so, 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 so why I bring that up is we're, we're so, interesting read. It's a great book. You should take a read because it's about firefighting, but it's really about the social problems and how it kind of mingles to that bottom where the, the last safety nets emergency services and that's kind of where we are. So I don't know what the fix is, but the, it's kind of an out of sight, out of mind thing. Um, it's in Woodbury, nobody's complaining about it, so it's not a problem. Is that kind of, that's, so I don't know who you bring it to or, but it need, there's an awareness that needs to take place and Patrick really helped me understand this is like, I wasn't speaking up, I, I do need to speak up because it's crushing the service. You know, we had another call last night with a mental health person. It's not their fault that they have a mental health crisis, but again, it drives the, the demand on the service and, and you're dealing with difficult circumstances. So, uh, you know, using that one, they've kind of pushed folks, you know, we've, yeah, we're having people that used to be near the hospital in downtown Montpelier or Barry, and now they're in Woodbury. <laughs> And so where they had a paid ambulance service to go deal with the routine structure that needs to be there, we now have us. <laughs> and we're waiting 20 minutes for an ambulance to get there and, and then the long transport for Hardwick Rescues. I'm on Hardwick Rescue and, and Deb's here with Hardwick Rescue too. And there's there's a, an increasing demand on that end too. That sort of answer, I don't know, but I mean, if we kind of keep an eye on the problem, I think, and we're aware of the problem, we maybe will come up, because I know there's a lot of smart people around here that may have, again, I kind of get lost in, the, in the, the doing, where it might not be objective to see how we fix it, right? If that sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Robin, I saw, yes. I saw you with your hand up earlier, yes. I would like to thank Paul and, um, his name right? I believe it was Jacob that came to the office the day that I called 911. Which time? <laughs> because we times. had somebody OD in the parking lot, and they told us to make sure we stayed into the building, which we did. Paul went and Jacob went over and dealt with this person, and they also stayed there to make sure the scene was safe for us to leave the parking lot. Yeah, because those can be very dangerous situations. A lot of these folks are injecting actively is open heroin and a lot of them will have a dog in the car. If you notice we park strategically because the most common response you get when you wake someone up is they, the car will be running, they just pull the gear selector into drive and slam the gas pedal down. So I learned early don't park, I tell you don't park in front or back of the car because <laughs> they just, they're just need to get out of there. They just, you know, their, their world is kind of an underworld and they just don't want any part of that. Most of the time I can get people to at least talk to me for a few minutes which we then give them some resources. I also want to thank Skip Ward, uh, Skip Marcazzoni, because he got a message through our computer system 
that we had a 911 call that day, and he called down to make sure everybody was safe at the office. Yes, that's true. Yes, I recognize you. Please state your name. Amy Dalton. Amy, Amy Dalton. Yes. Thank you so much for shedding light on an issue that is incredibly complex and very nuanced. I wanted to know if you thought, because of the overwhelming amount that you are responsible for and your team, if you feel like organizations such as Circle, such as Mosaic, such as Washington County Mental Health, should be given more than $650 annually, uh, repulsive. Um, $200 to Mosaic, the sexual assault agency, the only one in Washington County, and then a very minuscule $1,000 to Washington County Mental Health. These are programs that support the comorbidity. Substance use disorder is very complex. Most of these people are suffering from severe trauma. And like you said, they don't want to be addicts. And if we find the programs that are appropriate to help support the people who need the support most in our community, maybe some relief would be taken off you and your team. And I would encourage everyone to argue that we should be giving these agencies more than what we're seeing in this suggestion. Well, before Paul responds, uh, I just want to say those articles will be coming up later for discussion. However, however, there appears to be some similarities in the in the underlying discussion between those and those. So I, I think that's an appropriate question because we're talking about funding for issues that cross articles. So Paul, without an objection, we can have Paul respond. Just short that. answer. Yes. So I'm in favor of any system that's going to help deal with this problem. And having sat in the select board chair before, normally what happens is they bring us those budget items. So um, again, I think people overarching become more aware and just find out what these different service agencies do and how they might help and that again a group that work together that might, might, might be valuable to us so I, would... okay. I next recognize Randy Smith so I'll that comment a little bit that we're not denying more money to them that's the, that's what they requested yeah. uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, I saw that here first. Let's end the case with the other. Yes. I just want to point out that there are such that there are the first meetings in Hardwick that have started within the last few months. Um, and I went to the last one. I'm going to go to the next one. It brought together, I mean, it must have been 40 people in the room. People from uh, Jenna's Promise, people from places like Jose, people from Valley Vista. Law enforcement, drug enforcement, the town manager from Hardwick. It's, it was a multi, multiple, multitude of folks from different points of view discussing just that. Uh, Chip Triano explained the safe injection site bill that's happening for Rutland and Burlington. A lot of discussion around that. Is, is that appropriate for us? This is Woodbury, it's not Burlington, it's not Rutland. You know, these things came up, and that's a, a big meeting, but I'm, I'm thinking that from that could come smaller meetings that go to different towns once we know and are aware of how horrible this really is. Um, then let's, we, can, we can talk about it, these, and it's not, a, it's not a quick fix. This is, you know, I mean, I, it ha it's happened in my own family, and it took a decade of addiction. To, to, to recover, for, for my son to recover. So this could take a decade. This is not going to be tomorrow. Once oh, we do this, it's one and done. It's not going to happen. But we have to talk about it now. Otherwise, it's not going to happen at all. Yeah, that would agree. Um, yeah, I would agree. Next, I recognize Carol Ray. On a happy note, all I would like to say is I am totally blessed by being in a town with what you just told us, being totally supported by you, and thank you for um, managing that banquet and recognizing yeah, all of your volunteers. That was really, truly great, grateful. And, and I don't want to take all the credit. I'm just the, the guy with the white hat. Um, 
Yeah, there's a lot of folks, there's 20 some members total with the fire department that, that make this happen. And it wouldn't happen without those folks because we're not always here. They're not all here, so I can't brag on them. Uh, I, I saw first Joan Meacham. Do you have a question or comment? No. So now, excuse me, it's not a It's not a question, it's a thank you. We've had over the past seven years three instances where we had to call 911. One was a stupid thing I did. We that. And we learned the best of them. <laughs> the other two were family emergencies. One was about 10 minutes to midnight last year on New Year's Eve. 911. They were there within 10 minutes. They stabilized Susan, uh, got her on oxygen. Uh, part of the rescue showed up and off to the hospital she went. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes, Michael Sadler. <coughs> um, because the solution to the problem might be a long time coming, do you have a list of places where people in Woodbury or just in general our region can go for no questions asked, harm reduction supplies? That's a good question, and that's I think an area we could use the town website potentially where we could post that information. We have a website, but I think this, the town gets a lot more, so that, I think that's something we could work on pretty easily. And that, you might also be Yes, and have it available, certainly. <coughs> yep, I think that's a great idea. See, we're already getting good ideas because there's a lot of people thinking about it. Hi, I next recognize Ginger Atkin. I just want to point out that um, you can contact the Department of Health and they'll send you um, Narcan for you. Yeah. They have it with instructions and all that stuff, and there's um, they sent test strips for fentanyl are in that kit too? Yeah. Um, and we've got harm reduction kits and I have access to harm reduction kits that have all that stuff in them. Even that, even that step is a, that sometimes can be a barrier. Yes. To contact the Department of Health. So, um, the easier it is to get. You know, it's not everyone's equipped to just bang on somebody's window and go start talking to folks. That really works pretty good, but it's... Oh, it's yeah, that, you know, well, I don't even wear a uniform, but it's, it's a, you're exposing yourself to potential harm, and I don't advocate that for everybody. Okay, I see members who wish to speak a second time. Before that, is there any, anyone who has not yet spoken who wishes to now? Okay, first I, I, I will recognize, first I saw Brandy Smith. So I just want to put it out there that we are in need of a health officer. Um, if anybody is interested. <laughs> yeah, I see that's uh, an appointed position. An appointed position. And the select board can consider an increase of members of interest. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, please. Just um, yeah. very quickly, there is the North Central Vermont Recovery Center that's located in Morrisville. It is no questions asked. You can come in, you can sit and speak confidentially. It is a discreet and anonymous location where you can receive support services or simply talk about your substance use disorder. There's also an organization or agency called Never Use Alone. You can look them up online. They have an 800 number where people who are choosing to use a substance in the moment can be on the phone with a trusted crisis counselor who will then report anonymously if they are unresponsive or need support or anything worsens. Um, there are many organizations. Um, you just need to know about them. Could you just state again just the names of those organizations? Yes, uh, North Central Vermont Recovery Center in Morrisville, and um, the organization to call is Never Use Alone. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Thank what, you. What was the ah, right. Yes, I recognize Darren Yusuf. Yes. Darren Yusuf. Sorry. In light of all this conversation. I'm a little glib, I suppose, but do you think that you're asking for enough money? <laughs> it, 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 I wish we didn't have to spend so much money. The hardest article for me to deal with is the, the building, because it's expensive, but we need it. And I, we'll get to that one, but uh, I, I personally wish it didn't cost so much, but that's what it is. Um, there may be adjustments moving forward on, uh, you know, we're dealing with a truck fund and a capital fund. The capital funds not going to be adequate with the way 
of inflation we've been dealing with, so we'll have to work through those issues because the needs are there continuously. <laughs> and again, as the pressure continues on the service, you just can't, you got to keep doing it. Thank you, Paul. And I'll always throw out my, my caveat, we're always looking, we, we have a particular need for people that are interested in becoming emergency medical technicians. We provide all the training and all the equipment, always looking for people interested to be firefighters. Um, and some outside the box thinking is we're a private nonprofit corporation, so those that are good at disseminating information, those that might be a great business manager who wants to consider being president or vice president, or Hannah Morris is our treasurer, we handle a lot of money and we're accountable to you folks, and, and that uh, takes a lot of work. We have, we have the whole setup of how we're supposed to do that. Um, so again, outside the box thinking, I've had people offer to come help us organize our, our equipment inventories and things. So if, you, if you're interested at all, come see us. Uh, again, it might not be in a firefighting or EMT role, but you might have, be able to do public education. You might be able to do public outreach, keep up our website. These are the things that the fire chief just doesn't have time to do, because I'd love to be out doing that, but I need to be training firefighters and EMTs and keeping our skills uh, up to date. Yes, Greta Dunlap. Okay, well, I'm so I've joined the fire department. I'm not a firefighter in Mexico. So I'm going to work on the business side and help them with that stair. So Cindy just, oh, Cindy just reminded me just now that we're also looking to sort of get a, an auxiliary going to help the fire department when it fires to feed them, kind of coordinate things like that. And I have to tell you, I've been going to the Tuesday night firehouse meeting every Tuesday night for since I think July. And I'm watching them work. You probably think it's weird, I'm just watching. <laughs> and let me tell you something, truck check in the bitter cold of winter is no piece of cake. They can't do it in a building. So I skip those things. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can be there. <laughs> yeah, we're looking to within the department create that mechanism for those who don't want to be firefighters, who don't want to be EMS, who don't want to, you know, be one of the officers of a way in which the community can come in and help the fire department with some of those things. So, for example, when they were cleaning up for the flood, so many people came to help. So they also need that kind of support, emotional support, if you will. Um, and, and so, and thank you to Cindy for putting together that banquet. Cindy, it was a shot in the arm for the firefighters. So thank you. And the last thing I add is we're accountable to you folks budget-wise as we come right to this floor. So if there's ever questions about our budget, just give me a call or give Hannah a call. Um, we try to be as open as possible. If there's a number you might not understand, just ask. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to clear things up over the years. We've broken things into categories, so you know where the money's being spent. We spend a lot of town money, and I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that it's accounted for and spent properly. So that's our goal. The best we can. We have, we have at least one more question or comment. Do you want to meet you? I was going to do this at the end, but this now seems to be the time that this is happening. For those that don't know, the, the dinner that keeps getting talked about was a, the volunteer firefighters recognition dinner that Cindy Gordon organized. Um, it was really incredible. It was a really great um, opportunity to thank these individuals. Um, I learned a lot. I'm relatively new to town. Um, there are a couple of things that I wanted to bring up that I learned that I think are important, particularly as we're about to vote on the budget. Number one, the volunteer fire department was started because of home insurance. And so, if it goes away, all of our home insurances are going to go up because of all of the other things. There's a many other reasons to keep it, but that was something that I thought was really interesting that I don't know if everybody knows. And then the other thing that I heard there is uh, they don't get a lot of thank yous. And so, I think that's something that we all can do a better job of outside of town meeting there because they do a lot for us. So, thank you. And on 
on the insurance rating about three to four years ago, uh, we, the town investing in equipment, us investing in, investing in training, lowered. So Woodbury is typically what we call a 910 community because we don't have a paid fire service and we don't have a pressurized hydrant system. Uh, town with a pressure like Hardwick, they get an automatic six rating, which lowers your insurance. So what we did do was we took the processes with our neighboring communities for automatic mutual aid, practice with our neighboring communities, and passed the ISO test to get a class eight, which is about the best we can do for Woodbury unless we're gonna put in a pressurized hydrant system. So, so that lowered people's premium. We did that about four years ago and we're maintaining it. So that's another, thank you for raising that issue. We kind of forget what we do sometimes. <coughs> Okay. Oh, we have another oh, comment. Dr. Yeah. Susan, Martin. How many dry hydrants do we have here in Woodbury? I want to say there's eight right now. We lost the one in South Woodbury at the moment with the dam being down, so I don't know if we'll get that one back. And Paul, well, for any newcomers, what, what is a dry so hydrant? So a dry hydrant are those red pipes you see sticking <laughs> up out of the side of the road. What it allows, in the summertime, we can pull up almost anywhere in Woodbury, throw a suction hose into the water and start pumping water. In the wintertime, we've had less snow recently, so it's less difficult, but the lake's right there, but climbing over a five foot high snow bank into waist deep snow, shoveling down through five feet of snow, and then chopping through three feet of ice takes a little time. I remember bringing a Wall Street Journal reporter who came over, and then I had him go in. We were over on uh, Moscow Woods Road in Callis. They were reporting on a large fire we had there. And as he goes, how difficult is this? I handed him some hose and had him jump off the side of the road and right up his armpits. <laughs> So, so those hydrants, what they do is they're just a, they're underneath the frost line of the of the water, and we can just drive up, hook on, and draft draft from it. So that's what they do, they give us better access to water. Is there one right out here in the parking lot? There is one right over. There's a this is a tank. There's a 10,000 gallon water tank that's in the buried in the schoolyard. Then down by behind or between the annex and the old store is another dry hydrant right in the village. There's one up by Bailey Bridge Road as well, and on Green. There's, a, there's several around, and Callis is one more too. Okay, so hearing no other discussion, we'll proceed to the vote. It's been a while since we stated this article, so I'm going to do it again here and we'll vote. So we're on article. Eight, shall the voters appropriate $123,515.73 to fund the operations of the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department? The capital replacement fund to be paid in full by January 1st, 2025 in the amount of $32,000 and the operating expenses of $91,515.73 paid in quarterly installments of $22,878.93 starting July 1st, 2024. All those in favor of Article 8, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Article 8 is passed. The next article, Article 9. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 9? David Morse moves. I move to approve that. Okay, the article is moved. Is there a second? John, I saw John Gordon first. John Gordon seconds. I will state the article and put it up for discussion. Article 9. Shall the voters appropriate up to $100,100 to the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department due November 1st, 2024 for the purpose of financing the cost for construction of a new Fire and Emergency Operations Center at a total cost of $1,300,000. Is there any discussion? Yet, Paul Cerruti. 
Okay, and without objection, we'll invite Paul up, and he may stay here to field questions as they arise from the assembly. So, so okay. I'll tell you where we're at at the moment. It's been approved for the last two years. The elephant in the room is it's no longer $85,000 a year. It's now about 101000 The big driver of that is what we've seen around us is interest rates. Uh, we had contemplated an interest rate in 2022 of 1.5%, and it's now, I think we ended up with 5.5%. So that explains that difference in the interest rate. Total building cost has gone up. We could have probably been less than 1.3. It's probably closer to 1.4, driven by uh, the state has destroyed our leach field when we let them use the site over there and we knew that was going to happen so we have uh, we have a contract with them to pay for the design permitting and construction or construction of the new leach field and we also have in contract with them to pay about the seventy eighty thousand dollars difference in cost uh, from when we could have started last fall to when we could have started now and the last issue that kind of drove cost besides some inflation was uh, the, the heavy rain which we got on the floods last summer caused our bank to slump, which was a $50,000 increase in the retaining wall. So that kind of lays the groundwork. And so where we're at with the project right now, it's all permitted. We've borrowed the $1.3 million. We have enough funds with other funds that we have that you've given us to pay the difference in cost. We've kind of got to let the state money wander through. So I don't, some of this stuff's going to be change orders. So I don't know where the final cost is going to land yet until all of that stuff's been priced. Um, but right now we're aiming for a uh, May 1st construction date. So you should start seeing something happening. Um, we didn't take borrowing the money without knowing what people felt about the increased cost lightly, but we're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Our building was heavily damaged in the flood and we're in the FEMA process, uh, kind of uh, dealing with, are you gonna let us fix, Oh, let me back up a little bit. The original intent of this project was to build the new building and we would keep the old building because we needed that to store our trailers in our pumper, our mini pumper, and, and it would have been our equipment storage. That's how we took about seven or $800,000 off the cost of the new building and we fit it into the site, which through our work with all the different community members and community groups that we did over a few years, uh, wanted to keep this in the village, so it kind of limited us for space. Now that building's in limbo because it's been, we're at the phase with FEMA of is it more than 50% damaged? If so, we'd work with FEMA either to reconstruct that building in a flood resilient manner or relocate it somewhere else. So I don't know where that's gonna land. Um, it's been quite a process. I have a lot less hair than I had when I started dealing with FEMA. Uh, the second piece to this pie is uh, Norman had suggested last year that I apply for a federal earmark or congressionally directed spending through Bernie Sanders office and well, I'll crib note it, but lo and behold, we have $1.1 million that's earmarked for the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department that's kind of stuck in the, I don't know if you call it a budget anymore or a spending plan down at the Congress. Um, and it made it through all the steps, so it's there. If the budget passes, that comes to, well, it would go to rural development, right, Norman? That's a, a community development. And so I had a conversation, I met with Sanders' office two weeks ago personally, and then phone call last week, and then I met with Misty who's the head of the USDA, R RDA, and that money will come to them and be put in an account for us. Now I said, can we use it on the new building? And she said, no, because we didn't bid it to federal standards two years ago when we started this process. And she thinks backing up would end up costing more than what you're gonna get for the money. But I asked, could we use this money to remedy the old building problem? And she said, yes. So that's our intent. If the money comes through, we'll, we'll She's suggesting a parallel path with FEMA and U USDA to, to see where, where we land. So what that looks like, I don't know because I'm not driving that process, the federal government is, and we'll just have to wait and see. I'll take any questions. Yes, yes. Sorry, question, but it's a comment. I, uh, I do work for rural development, so I'm going to my boss. Okay. We're yeah. very resident, so I won't be touching the project. I just want to clarify on this for a conflict of interest. But the only way, my understanding is, the only way that authorization will come through through the congressionally directed spending is if we get a full budget. Right now, we're running on continuing resolutions. Sure. So if we get a full authorized budget for the remainder of this fiscal year, then that will come through. Right. That's the issue we're up against. Yeah, thank you for clarifying, because I didn't understand how that works. I know they have like these spending plans. 
Yeah, for what it's worth, our agency's on a one week. We, we've got one week of work now through March 8th. That's right, because they're just, yeah, spending yeah. resolution. They just keep kicking the can, unfortunately. So it's not a sure thing, but it's it's far enough down the path where at some point I think the budget will pass and see how we can do most. If not, there's money through FEMA that we would be working with, but I just don't know who's going to win that foot race. Uh, can I ask a question? I'll, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll come back. Uh, I recognize next Ginger Hedkin. Uh, I just wonder, did I understand you correctly that the money we've authorized the last last year for um, however many years we've authorized it? Is, do you have that money? Still? I do have. We haven't spent any tax money on this project yet. But, but you collected. It. You've got it's it. in the bank. Yep. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So far, everything that's been, has been done with donations and labor and time. So. We have yet to spend one tax dollar on this project, and it's probably about a quarter million dollars worth of value. Uh, we have 13 permits, but that just sewer your capital. And I have to replace one permit already. My next, my next up, John Gordon. So just to uh, clarify, make sure I understand it correctly, um, there's a number of things in process, insurance, FEMA, uh, potentially this other funding stream. But in order for us to move forward, because that's all, we don't know where all that's going to land, we need to do this so we can go ahead and move forward. And if that stuff does materialize, then it will factor in after the fact and reduce the total outlay. Right, because the part of this project that wasn't funded was the fixing up of the old station, which is now more badly damaged than it was. So we desperately need to get out of the spot we're in. Uh, the water was 37 inches deep. Um, even reusing that for the type of use we're talking about, we can manage that because it's, it's trailers and things that can be quickly pulled out. We lost during the flood pretty much all of our office equipment, all of our tools. It just was heartbreaking to watch. So um, again, we just got to get across the street with our expensive stuff. That's piece one, resolve this, and we're ready to go, ready to pull the trigger on this deal. Yes, sir. What, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll recognize everyone who hasn't spoke once, and I'll come back, okay? Yeah. Yes, sir. Could you state your name again, just so I remember? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, Robbie Gilman. Robbie Gilman. Robbie Gilman. Okay. So I, I was just wondering, have you ever considered uh, lowering the cost of the building by building uh, locally harvested and provided green lumber and used doors and windows. So we've gone out to bid as a design and build project. We saved money on the front end of that by not spending a whole lot of money on the design part of it. You'll pay some of it. So what we're going to end up with is a totally new station that meets our needs. So, so no, the answer is no, but I think we're getting what we need out of it for I want to call that reasonable, but that's the best we can do. Okay. Any other comments from someone who's not yet spoke? Okay, Sean Fielder is correct? Yeah, yes. Sean Fielder, I didn't identify myself earlier. Sorry about that. Yep. Paul, I don't know if the uh, insurance matter is like at the legal stage right now, so you can't necessarily comment on it, or can you offer more as far as why the insurance companies hold things up? Slightmore's heard my rant. Great question. So the citizens might be able to help in some So so where we're at now is the insurance company stonewalled us on the existing building, and not to do with what we're voting on right now, with the existing building uh, for about four and a half months and got really nasty with us. So the previous budget you considered we're we're switching companies because it was so bad. Just uh, imagine your house burns down in five months later they're yelling at you for bothering them. So that's what we ran into. The problem with the league and, and what I ran into talking to other towns that have lost town-owned facilities is you do okay on the equipment, which they paid us, we've got the money now for 100% of the equipment that we lost. But what we didn't recover all of is the total damage to the old building. The high estimate for the adjuster was about 127 or $8,000. The mid estimate was about ninety-one thousand dollars, and they took depreciation and paid us seventy-six. So there's a huge gap right now. And the problem with, with so the answer is we should just wait and see right now. Um, we we can go back, and you guys are dealing with the same issue. If you're budgeting to actually get the work fixed, 
costs more than what they've allotted, I think the total payout on that building is 350, so we would have to apply back to them with our proof of extra cost. It's kind of in limbo at the moment because we gotta see where USDA or FEMA goes because anywhere in those processes, they might say you gotta go back to the insurance company and try to get some more money. That sort of answer it? I think it's a wait right now because they have paid us, we've got the money sitting in the bank. We did have to spend around 25,000 to get the building to where it is, which FEMA considers temporary repairs. Um, the frustrating part of this whole process was FEMA arrived and said they'd build us a 5,000 square foot facility right on that beautiful site over there. Uh, I didn't know, and he says, I'll build you this beautiful new 5,000 square foot facility to move into and we'll have it done by February. And I said, oh, that's awesome. Then he goes, but you can't, after five years, you can't use it for a fire station because it's just a temporary building. I said, well, I can't have you build a temporary station where a new station is supposed to go. And so this is in the middle of, I was tall, all stressed out. It was October, there's no heat, there's no insulation. We're trying to, and so my hair went a little bit, it's falling out. And then he says, he says, uh, I said, I, I went like, well, that's gonna cost, I have budgeting. I said, that's gonna cost like 1.1 million. He goes, chief, we are not concerned about the money. I said, okay, I said, but can you just build me I'll, you build the building and then we can take our funds and resources and make it into what we need. Nope. So I said, never mind, we'll just fix the old one for now. So FEMA was really frustrating. Cabot's going through that. They actually built a temporary facility, which may end up, I don't know how it'll work, but that's probably where they're stuck for a while. I have just no idea. For the record, that was FEMA, not real. Right, that was FEMA. <laughs> FEMA's, FEMA's been really frustrating. I finally got my third, we're on the third FEMA guy, right? Yes, fourth. Fourth, fourth FEMA person. We're on fourth because they were, you, we handed them all this information, all, multiple meetings, meeting, 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 information, all gone, pile, and then she's like, well, now you guys gotta put it all in. I'm like, excuse me? And we had spreadsheets that didn't add, and uh, how do you take volunteer labor and put it on a workforce sheet that contemplates benefits? And so finally a new FEMA guy came, and he arrived, I met with him Wednesday, and he was, it, it's all on there now, so the only thing waiting in limbo is the building. So I've been advised by consultants to let them drag their feet on that until all these other processes play out. I wish I had greater answers, but that's just welcome to my frustration. So getting this new building ready and start building it will give us some surety. And this solves a great deal of our stress. Um, what would happen is we would move our equipment into the old facility that needs to be there temporarily, and we would figure out what that looks like moving forward. So, Paul, yep. Yep. Diana um, if you get the insurance money... We do have the insurance money right now. Yeah, but if you get more because yep. you, things cost more and they might give you more. And the FEMA, are you still going to be able to use the USDA money if it comes through? So, so from talking to Misty, that would be determined at the time oh. who wins the foot race. Mm -hmm. So I, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> so I wish I knew. wish I knew. Now, our goal has been right along, because we, we would like to bond this. The reason for bonding is right now we're at 5.5% interest in 10 years in arms, so whatever the interest rate is in 10 years, because it's commercial lending. This would be something the select board would have to do, and the kind of the community might want to, because this is what I would like to do, is the, uh, we can't bond because we're not a municipality. What the select board could do, and with our work together, we can word an article correctly, which would then allow the select board to borrow the money for 20 years. We would not have to keep voting on this every year. It would just go into their budget, but that would require an Australian ballot vote worded correctly. So if that's kind of, I'd like to go there, if everyone wants to go there, once we know everything's paid for, which again, a building starting in May, we should be done by November, should have all our costs associated, maybe we could do that for next year if people think that's a good idea, because it would, right now it would drop that interest rate to 3%. So I think it's the way to go. Again, non-binding, but what do people think? Good? Yeah. So I'll take that as a yes, and I don't know if we'll have it ready by next year, because I want the cost done. I need, what it's been like is having 15 balls in the air, and you're waiting for these balls to land. I think I have it down to like three or four now. But at one point, we had the state on our site, and contractors just was like, well, you do, I don't know. Can you move the grader so I can drive my fire truck out. That's <laughs> they were great though, by the way. Well, you're doing a good job of running this program. Yeah. Well, you had a great time when I'd give an update, right? It's so always hard to follow. You feel like, woo.
Sometimes not. We had called, the, they thought I was kidding. The guy down there is like, well, how often? You guys don't go out much. I said, we do it about 10 times a week. Lady, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> you can sleep later. Any other discussion? Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Okay, hearing no further discussion, we'll proceed to the vote. Before we do that, I will restate the article. We are at Article 9. Article 9 states, shall the voters appropriate up to $100,100 to the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department due November 1st 2024, for the purpose of financing the cost for construction of a new fire and emergency operations center at a total cost of $1,300,000. Does everyone understand the consequences of a yes and a no vote here? Okay, so all those in favor of Article 9, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Article 9 is passed. Thank you. Brings us to Article 10. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 10? I recognize Skip Marcassani. I move that we consolidate Article 10 through Article 30, single vote. That would leave Articles uh, 31, 32, 33, 34 to be considered individually. Okay. I, I'll, I'll, I just want to explain and then we'll proceed here. Robert's Rules recognizes uh, a motion for a series of resolutions. In, in resolutions, in our case, are the articles. They are the main motion. So Re Robert's Rules recognizes a motion for series, properly made. However, one condition. These articles are, are unrelated, in a sense. And because they are any one member of the assembly here, at, at, at your request, may remove, may request, and we will, remove any one of these articles in the series. So if you want to deal with that separately, discussion and voting separately out of that series, that's how we'll do it. And you may bring that up until, until the point at which we vote. So. You could say it now after I look for a second. So, um, so we have a motion for a s to move in a combined sense, a series, to combine articles 10 through 30 and consider them and vote on them as one. Is there a second? Okay, Goddard Graves seconds. Now, before we get into discussion, I, I will put it put it squarely. Does anyone wish to remove one or more of those separate articles from the series, from the combination? No. Okay. You may, you may, so if that comes up, let me know, okay? So we have we have a motion seconded and we're on articles 10 through 30. And I will, I will put to the assembly here, without objection, by unanimous consent, I will not read through each separate article. <laughs> unless, unless someone wishes me to read one or more, including all. Uh, yes, yes, we're, st we're still, we're, st we're not debating these yet. We're still in the, uh, we're still working on the order. So these are points of order here. Yes, 
Lucinda Smith, yes. want to stay here. We will, have, we will have an opportunity to discuss any of these articles in the series. We just got them moving um, and I, I, I seek by unanimous consent uh, your agreement to not read each article but rather we can consider them and if they need, if you wish for any to be read in the process please let me know. So, Okay, unanimous, without objection, yes, and moved. Okay, all right, so here we go. We have a series of articles, moved and seconded. It's 10 through 30. We don't need to read them here. Uh, so, opens it up to discussion. Is there any discussion uh, in this motion, including articles 10 through 30? Yes, I recognize Patrick Flood. I don't like this to sound the wrong way at all, but in looking at these articles like Lucinda was just saying, we could add $500 to our contribution to Washington County Mental Health. They don't even notice it, right? It will not change a thing. I'm not saying we can't or shouldn't. It, it will make us all feel better. But what really needs to be done is to talk to our legislators about the fact that some of these organizations are woefully underfunded and have been forever. They can't provide the services that we want them to provide because they don't have a base budget that allows them. So what we really should be doing, in my opinion, is to follow up on Paul's question about talking about the powers that be. We should be talking to our legislators about why these services are not funded properly. Um, Senator Perchlick is on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate. He is in a very advantageous position to argue why we should give more money to mental health, more money to uh, any crisis service. And I think we should work, you know, we should spend our time working on Senator Perchlick and, and our other legislators. You know, we don't need to go into all those details, but they're the ones who are really control the solution to this problem. So, if you want to raise it, it's fine with me, but the real solution is a much more comprehensive political one. Yes, I recognize Darren Yusinowitz. To, for my own understanding, as well as maybe everybody else's, but these numbers are brought to the select board from the organizations. That's the numbers that they are specifically requesting. Is there. I, I don't know, dialogue, can there be for next year and say, look, we have a community that benefits from these, that wants to add extra support. Do you think they would be receptive to that? Or do you think that would just be a, you know, well, no, we just need this much? Yep, I, yep I, without objection, I'll come over here right now and then go back to the floor just for an answer from our select board. Sorry, it's just a point of order, but I can, I can respond to that. It, it's an open dialogue. Um, these are the numbers that they typically have requested from us. They haven't changed a tremendous amount over the last few years. Um, there's a lot of different organizations that we can interact with. We don't have the bandwidth to actually work with all of these organizations on a regular basis to make sure that we're getting the funding that's appropriate and making sure that they um, have what they need. Um, so that's a conversation that we would be, the select board I'm sure would be willing to have. I'm speaking as a, not your select board person anymore, by the way. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> so uh, I'm channeling my other select board members, but it's a conversation that we've tried to have in the past. Um, we can't get out to every organization to do this appropriately. But uh, if we had some willing volunteers from the town who were willing to help us with outreach, we can certainly make sure that these conversations are appropriate. 
the numbers are obviously going to go up. They're never going to go down. Darren, I hope that yeah. partially answers your yeah. question. Mm -hmm. uh, I will come right back here, but before I saw Norm Metkin. Yeah, well, um, I've been well, on the other end of this for various organizations that have requested funds. Norm, could you stand up? Yeah. Here, sorry. sorry. Okay, I usually talk loud, but that's okay. Uh, the, uh, I'm saying that having been on the other end making these requests on behalf of organizations and stuff, it, this is not something that they're doing for their operating budget. They're doing this to show community support for their organization. And they come up with an appropriate amount that they think is readable to request the different communities they serve. And I think, um, I don't think personally that there's a need to go ahead and try to increase amounts in this form. I think anyone in this body that wants to can make donations to whatever organization they want to and support them with greater funds um, rather than having the taxpayers, old taxpayers, have to pay for it. Uh, that's my own feeling about it. And I think the important thing is to show that you support the organization by giving any amount requested. And uh, that's really what they're after with this. Not, it's not a big part of their operating budget, typically, for most organizations anyway. Thank you. Recognize Lisa Flood. So I'll just say that I was the one who got Washington County Mental Health on the morning the first time. Um, having I had worked there, and we went through a process where we served 20 towns, and we um, designated amount based on population primarily and the number of calls we get. But it also is like if you want to increase your request, you have to get a petition and go around and have people sign a petition. So. It's a little bit of a hindrance to revisit it. Um, and I don't know if that could be different. No. Yes, Diana Caduzzi. I just wanted to explain that the town, I don't know how many years ago, but before your time, did implement a policy that if they want to increase their uh, um, allocation or their request, they have to go around to, a, to get a whole petition if they come back year after year with the same request, then they don't have to. So that's something that if people want to consider changing that, you could consider that. Yes, John Reed. So listening to Paul and listening to Patrick and others, um, it seems like a good idea would be to suggest to the select board and perhaps this could come up under the uh, continuing or other business of the non-binding resolution. I'd like to set a select board to appoint a task force to study this issue and you know, for avenues of advocacy, appropriate funding, etc. Rather than trying to ad hoc change amounts that are appropriate to specific groups. Carol? Carol? Carol Yeah, that kind of answered my question. But I was thinking that if we raise some of those amounts in these articles, that we need to add more money. Does that mean their agencies are responsible to go door to door next year because the rate from what they asked for this year increases next year? Do they have to go out to get the petition? No. No. Chris, yes, please. No. Okay. Any more discussion on our series of articles 10 to 30? Okay. Well, hearing none, we proceed to the vote. So, we have a motion that's made and seconded. We've discussed it. We are about to vote on a com combination, a series of articles 10 through 30. One vote will decide the whole matter. Are there any questions about the consequences of the vote here? Okay, so all those in favor of approving articles 10 through 30, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Articles 10 through 30 are passed. Okay, that brings us to Article 31. 
What is your pleasure with respect to Article 31? Okay, moved by Skip Marcassani. Is there a second? Second. Second, I see, I heard for <laughs> Robin, did you second? Okay, seconded by Robin Durkee. So Article 31 is made and seconded, and I'll read the article here. Article 31. Shall the voters authorize general fund expenditures for operating expenses of $501,815.97, of which $232,204.97 shall be raised by property taxes and $269,611 by non-tax revenues. Is there any discussion on Article 31? Uh, yes, Jim Schweithan. I just have a question. Um, where do the non-tax revenues come from? I mean, that might be a naive question. Que question about where, where do the non-tax revenues come from? Is there someone, that, uh, someone from the town that could answer? And on page 24. Okay, Diana Peduzzi, yes? Page 24 of the budget. Um, of the town report, it shows uh, revenues totaling, well, whatever, a tech of, there are government grants, there are state grants, there are all kinds of permits and other things that. So the, just, to, just to summarize, so the non-tax revenues come from a variety of sources including grants and funds from the state that are given to the town, okay? Any other comments, discussion on Article 31? Okay. Hearing none, we'll proceed to the vote. Is everyone, does everyone understand the consequences of the vote on Article 31? Okay, okay. Okay, all those in favor of Article 31, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Article 31 is passed. Brings us to Article 32. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 32? Paul, I first saw Paul, Paul Cerruti moves it. Skip Marcassani seconds, okay? Competing for motions and seconds. Okay, Article 32 states, Shall the voters authorize highway fund expenditures of $654,462, of which $531,792 shall be raised by property taxes and $122,670 by non-tax revenues. Is there, is there a discussion on Article 32? I recognize Paul Cerruti. Well, I just wanted to quickly point out, I think I brought this up the other night, correct me if I'm wrong, but the select board and the road department has managed to get our flooding maintenance done and repaired without borrowing money, correct? Correct. But using some state money. So having sat in three other towns' select board meetings, many other towns have had to borrow big bucks. So thank you for doing that. It was a lot of work. And it may happen in the future that they're going to have to borrow some money depending on what the, what the FEMA reimbursement comes out of that. But for now, 
we're a lot better off than a lot of people around us who've extended their borrowing limit to the point where they can't even borrow another dollar to get the roads back in shape. So I know there's been some conversation and things aren't great at the road department, but I, I wanted to point out a positive that they got the roads back in service and hopefully we'll have a nicer summer <laughs> where they can catch up. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, I recognize okay. Lizzie Higgins. I just want to add to Paul's statement that our treasurer, Brandy, deserves a big yeah, thank you for that work. <laughs> yes, Michael Sadler. Uh, does that money also include the money that people take to implement the municipal roads general permit work that we have to do in the area? Is there someone that could field that question? Without objection, Michael Gray. For uh, this past year, um, the, the road crew wasn't really able to work on any of those um, grants. There's three of them now that have been approved for for the town, and hopefully they'll get to them next summer. Um, but there is always a small amount of that high, town highway budget money that is devoted to the municipal roads general permit and the grants and aid program. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more discussion under Article 32? Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed to the vote. Are there any questions about the consequences of the vote on Article 32? Okay, I see none. Okay, all those in favor of Article 32, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Article 32 is passed. Brings us to Article 33. To transact any other non-binding business that may legally come before the meeting. Is there a motion on Article 33? Sarah, Sarah Van Hoff, you move Article 33. Yep. Motion? Yeah. Okay, Sarah Van Hoff moves it. Is there a second? Second. Uh, I'm sorry, was it Carol? Carol yep. Carol. <laughs> yeah. We'll give credit to Carol here for the seconding of Article 33. And, and I'll, I'll state it again. Article 33, to transact any other non-binding business that may legally come before the meeting. And Sarah, you made the motion, so you may you have a right to speak first. I just want to make sure that came up during the meeting. I'm I'm sorry? We never voted on Article 2. We voted on it, so I want to make sure it came up before we adjourned. That is that is true. That is it. So we didn't really vote. It, it is okay. yeah. It, uh, it's like we're talking about point of order here. There's no question at Article 2. Okay, so we don't have to vote on it. There's no vote. There was, a, there was a motion to discuss it. When the, when the discussion ended, the motion ended. Okay, I yeah, I didn't it didn't, didn't, didn't need to be resolved by a vote. Um, and on that, on that point, I, I'll make a comment as the moderator. And, and as, as someone who proposed to the select board that this Article 2 not be framed as a question, as we typically do, following the, the guidance from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, they, they recommend framing Article 2, the consideration of the printed report, simply as a matter for discussion, be, because there's, there's no substantive action in, in that article. So that's, that's my explanation as, as moderator and as someone who proposed that it be framed not as a question. Any, any qu questions on that? I know we're, so we're still in a point of order here. Yes, Patrick. So <clears throat> if there were inaccuracies in the report and they were corrected from the floor, how, that, how is that recorded? In the, just in the minutes of, of our meeting? 
That's why usually there's a motion and then you have you can have you can approve an amended report. That's all. I, I'm just pointing out the only way we would if we didn't have any corrections today, that's great. But sometimes we do and the only way they're gonna be recorded is in the minutes of time meeting. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Still on the point of order here, uh, Chris Casey. And I, I just wanted to make a quick statement and remind folks that although we voted on the municipal budget today, Tuesday is when you're going to vote on your school budgets. Don't forget to go vote on Tuesday for, for your Hazen budget and for your mountain budget. And until out here. Okay, so, so we're now, we're now Considering Article 33, this is discussion about non-binding business that's appropriate there. Yep. Any other comments about the t t business that can come before the town non-binding? We'll, we'll come around here. We've got a couple. First of all, I recognize Carol Ray. Uh, I just want to thank the town for 30 years of support on the Woodbury Callis Food Shop. I'm co-director. Jan Grove is director in the Callis. Thank you for your food donations. And on a happy note, the food shelf is very financially stable. It's under good leadership. And <laughs> take your money and give it to other places that you feel personal. Thank you. Okay, we saw some more hands up. I can see Skip and then come around here. Skip Marcus Hanna. Uh, this is an advertisement of sorts about uh, 10 years ago, about 2010, somewhere around there, I made the mistake of responding to a, a posting that Diana Peduzzi had made. She needed some computer help in the clerk's office. It seems like I'm a permanent fixture there now. <laughs> <laughs> the clerk's office, if I spent time in the clerk's office, I would go down there and be a fly on the wall. It's amazing what these people do and what they handle, uh, from the easy stuff to the ridiculous stuff. Uh, the clerk's office has become more and more web and PC centric. You can't expect the three people that are in that office to be PC experts who can run the office also. So that sort of falls to me. They're, they're good at what they do and they, they can take some of the PC stuff. But in today's environment, we're going to get hacked. It's a fact of life because they're interacting with all these other agencies all, all over the state bunch of other organizations that aren't going to be safe. Are we trying to be safe? Yes, we're trying to be as safe as we can, okay, in terms of the, the, uh, the, the, the software we've got implemented. And uh, it, it's interesting, the number of phishing or scam emails that Robin gets, and she can figure out something for herself, and she can't figure it out, she sends her the new email, and I say yes or no. You know, that's going to increase. Again, something's going to slip through the cracks and we're going to get hacked. I am in conjunction with the, the staff of the Select board, we're putting in mitigation efforts that will allow us to recover as quickly as possible in terms of how we do backup and backup that's not on the PCs. Uh, the problem I have is I'm one person. A lot of this is in my head as I try and document stuff. If something happens to me, what the expression type of screen? Okay? I ready to back me up again. I'm looking for someone that's got IT talent, okay? You've got to be comfortable digging into the guts of the PC hardware. You've got to be comfortable working with software in terms of shooting bugs, and troubleshooting, installing, deleting, etc. If you are a person of that nature and want to become my, my, my become the co-IT chair, so to speak, I'd be happy to hear from you. If you know somebody that might be interested or gullible enough to do this, I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Other discussion under Article 33? Yeah, Patrick Flood. Uh, I want to follow up on John's suggestion from about 10 minutes ago. And I, I would hate to think we, after hearing what we heard today from Paul about what they're dealing with, I would hate to leave here today without some sense that we're going to follow up as a town and think about it. solutions. And, and it's a multi-faceted problem with multi, it needs a multi-faceted answer. 
So I, I don't think we need to do anything formal here, but I, I'd like to think that some of us would agree to get together in the coming week or two and at least start that conversation. Talk to the select board, talk to the fire department. Uh, so I'm just putting that out there. If somebody else wants to take the lead, be my guest. But the minimum we can do is put something on front court forum and say we're going to have a discussion. Everybody's welcome to take it from there. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes, the next question now is Bernie Miranda O'Neill. Thank you for your time. This may be a little bit out of time, but um, I'd like us to make a motion or make a statement regarding the situation in Gaza due to the Palestine uh, and Israel conflict and, and joining other town meetings and legislators in our own state who have also made the statement that we call for an immediate ceasefire and the unconditional release of all hostages. Okay. I hope this is Murder. appropriate. Murder, Murder has, has made a statement and potentially a proposed motion about a matter that in my view is out of the jurisdiction of this town. However, however, this, this assembly may entertain this this motion and this statement. Um, yeah, okay, okay. Could could we we have it repeated? Yeah, okay. So thanks. I'm calling for us in Woodbury to put out a statement saying that we call for the immediate ceasefire and the release of all the um, um, hostages due to the conflict between this and Okay, so just a proposed motion, non-binding, but for as an advisory um, message I delivered. Think, yes, I think it's good to join the chorus of all the other town meetings that are making similar statements and our legislation mm -hmm. also made. So this is a proposed uh, statement calling for a ceasefire in the in the between uh, due to the conflict conflict between Israel and Palestine. Okay. Ceasefire in the conflict between Israel and Palestine. And the uh, <coughs> returning all hostages unconditionally. And returning and returning the hostages unconditionally. Well, I guess releasing the hostages. Releasing. Before we proceed on this I have I've, I've ruled that this is out of order because it's outside the jurisdiction of this town. By unanimous consent, without objection, we could put that motion on the floor. So first I'll ask, is, is there objection to bringing this motion to the floor? An objection. Yes. There is. I would like, as an individual, I would like to object to your ruling for this reason: whether or not it's in our jurisdiction or in our power to change anything. I think it is always good for any decent person to make a principled statement on any issue, whether we choose to do that or not, is is a big issue. But I don't think the juris the jurisdictional interpretation you put on it is really appropriate given the immensity of the problem. I'll okay. say that as an individual. Okay, so we have, a, we have a challenge to the ruling of the moderator. In this case, in this case, we will put that to the assembly here. We will put that up to a vote whether to sustain the ruling of the moderator. And again, that that's the, the, the ruling that we're considering here is the, the subject of the ceasefire is outside the, the jurisdiction of the town. So that's what we're talking about here. My ruling on that. Okay. So here's here's what we do. It's it's a motion. And the motion is this. I put this forward. Shall the ruling of the moderator be sustained? 
I, I will state my rationale, and then each member of the assembly may speak on the, on the matter, and then I may add some closing comments, and then we go to a vote whether the ruling of the moderator shall be sustained. So, my understanding of the proposed motion is that the, 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 the issue, the effect, the business of the town, that it's beyond the jurisdiction of the town to, to take action on that matter. So, that's, that's, my, that's my rationale for the ruling. So now, now it's out for discussion. Point of order. Yes? I, I think this is all moot because you, as soon as Goddard made his comment, prior to Goddard made his comment, you would already come to the floor to say, do we want to discuss this? I think that's what we're going to step in about that this morning. Well, well, I, we'll re retrace here, and I will, I will, I will, State from my memory where we were in the procedure. Myrna Rose, she proposed a, a resolution or a motion. I ruled that discussion on that, that resolution, out of order. However, that um, that that could be that could be an, an exception could be made by unanimous consent without objection of the, t the town. So, my, uh, my, my ruling now is, is up for debate. Okay. Yes, John. Just a point of order. Did I, do I recall correctly, I thought that you said that a ruling of the moderator could be overturned by two-thirds. No, by a majority. Majority. By a majority. Okay, so. By a majority vote. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it? Yes. I don't LA see Hayes. anything in the article that says it has to be relevant to the town. It says to transact any other non binding business that can legally come before the meeting. So I really don't see why we have to extend this debate really any further. Okay, it's my it's my ruling it's my ruling on whether to bring that motion to the floor, whether to approve, whether to put that to the to the assembly, whether it should should be approved or not, to send a message from the town. So here we are. My ruling is under discussion, and anyone may speak on it. Yes. Oh. Robbie Gilder. Yes. <laughs> yes. I wrote it down. This is a really uh, disturbed community. It's a different view. And my parents uh, were both in Nazi Germany and Hitler became chancellor. So my family ran from that situation and that's why I'm lost. I didn't do it that way. What's, what's difficult for me about what's going on right now is when I recognize the Israelis passed off from being attacked on October 7th. But the way the Israeli government is responding, uh, claiming self-defense, is so strikingly like what the Nazis did to my people uh, all the years. And what's difficult to me about what you're saying about no jurisdiction, I'm sitting here paying federal taxes every year. So <clears throat> my money, I have blood on my hands because my money is going to support and produce and deliver the bombs that are annihilating the, the Palestinian people just to exterminate them. That's the policy that the Israeli government has taken up. It's wrong, and we ought to confront Joe Biden and tell him, no, it's our money. Stop doing that. Yes, Darren. So, as I understand it, we're right now discussing whether your decision not to go forward with Mirda's motion was acceptable or not, correct? Yes. So, 
while I don't disagree with anything, and I actually support Mirna's uh, proposed amendment, I, I have to say that I think your ruling is sound in that that our town does not really have much of a say or control over federal international policy. However, I do think that we can move past that and as an assembly say, great, that's a swell ruling. We're going to say it anyway. <laughs> I mean, am I wrong in that? Here's, a chance here's, to say that. here's my understanding of where we are with procedure. I made a ruling that that was out of order. Now we're talking about my ruling. Even if, even if it is out of order, the assembly still has an opportunity to bring this to the floor. So you, you, may, you may override my ruling, and you may decide, you may decide to discuss this. Yeah. Yes. I would like to make a motion that we override your ruling and uh, and then get to discuss and vote on the re proposed non-binding resolution. Okay. And I'll okay. Second that motion. Yeah. Okay. That I, I'm going to rule that motion out of order because it's it's pending. It's in my it's effect. It's it's effect. Well, no, no. I, it's effectively pending. If there's a motion here. Shall the ruling be sustained? You may vote against it, and then my ruling will be will be void. So, so that effectively, that is the motion here. Okay. 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 Now we have a motion to call the question. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second. Could you state your name? David Johnson. David. Johnson. David Johnson. Thank you. Okay. So. We have a properly made motion to call the question. And the underlying question is, shall the decision of the moderator be sustained? We're not voting on that right now. What we are voting, no, what we are voting on right now is this motion to call the question. And that means, that means we will cease debate and go right to the vote. On the, on the decision of the moderator. So this, this, this vote to call the question requires two thirds to cease debate. So we're, we're going to do this by a, a, a division of the House so we can count it. All those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hand. Okay. All those opposed, okay, it's clear to me that the motion passes to call the question. Now we move to a vote on the question of whether the decision of the moderator shall be sustained. Okay. So, does everyone understand the consequences of this vote? Okay, all right. Shall the decision of the moderator be sustained? All those in favor, say. All those in favor, say aye. All those opposed, say no. 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 Okay. I'm I'm going to initiate a vote by show of hands. The division of the house. It's not clear to me. Your side is in the majority. Can you so, clarify, please, what we're voting on? Yes, point? yes, we are voting on my ruling. As Your to, ruling, can my, you repeat the ruling? Yes, my ruling that the subject, the motion proposed by Myrna is, is outside the jurisdiction of the town, the town business. So that's, that's my ruling. But even if, even if my, my, my ruling is, is um, if my, my ruling uh, stands, the assembly still may entertain this by, by suspending the rules. I simply made a, a, I made a ruling on the rules as they stand. Okay, so, so point of order. I'm just wondering if the room knows what the word sustain means and what the implications okay. are. Okay, I'm explain. Okay. 
the motion shall the moderate shall the decision of the moderator be sustained means will it shall it hold? Do you agree with that? Do you agree? Okay, so that's the question. Do you agree with the, the ruling of the moderator? So these are points of order. Now we come back to my call for a division of the house because the because the voice vote was too close for me to hear. Yes, Norm. Point of order. So if that's the case, um, if they sustain your decision, then I imagine we move to Article 34. Yes. No. 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 Article 33 is, is is still being discussed. This is one item under Article 33. Yeah, we, 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 already. Uh, if your decision is sustained, then that shouldn't be discussing so we already ruled that in the future. But but there may be other discussion under Article 33. This yes, is one one item. One item under that article. So now we're, we're going to vote by division of the House, which is a show of hands, on the question of whether my ruling that that subject is outside the jurisdiction of the town, whether that, th whether that my ruling shall be sustained, whether it shall be in, stay in effect. So all those in favor of sustaining the, the ruling of the moderator, please raise your hand. And could we please get a count on this? I ask the Board of Civil Authority to get a count of the hands. Come to this side. Six on this side. So it's 25. Can we count, Robin? 25 total? No. I had 20. 20 25? 25 would love. 25. 25. Okay. All those opposed who thinks the moderator's ruling should not be sustained. Okay. Despite my ruling, you as an assembly have the right to suspend the rules beyond my ruling on the order. You have a right to suspend the rules and bring this discussion to the floor. And it can be done by unanimous consent without objection, I'm going to explain this, or it can be done by a vote, two thirds. You need two thirds. Two thirds. Yes, we have a. a is it a point of order or a question? Point of order question. Yes. This article means that everything done within it is non-binding on the town and the rest of the people here, right? That is correct. It's and that's why you suspend it. It's it's not because if it's passed, it then becomes binding. No, 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 no. The, the reason I, I, I ruled it out of order because, in my view, that subject is, is, is beyond, it's made up legally come before me, it's beyond the scope of the, the town's jurisdiction. So, so, that, so that was, that was settled. Um, so now, yes, Dan. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules. Consider a non-binding 
statement as Mira has put forth. Okay, so we have a motion made by Darren to suspend the rules and bring Vernon's resolution to the floor. Yes? Okay. Skip? Yeah? Second. Okay. So we have a motion that's made and seconded to suspend the rules and come back and bring Myrna's resolution to the floor for discussion and vote. So, are there any questions about where we are in the procedure and what we're about to vote on? But vote, about to vote on suspending the rules to bring this to the floor. Okay, yes, Ellie? Would it be possible to see if those present here would be willing to move to vote on Mirna's amendment without further discussion? Yeah. No, we have to uh, Well, we have. We did well, well, we, we, we haven't put that out. Yeah. Point, of, point of order, I think we have to bring it to the floor first, and then we can vote it's to. Second. So, so let's we'll finish the voting on this. So, because we need uh, two thirds to pass, we'll do this by show of hands. All those in favor of suspending the rules to enable the resolution that Martin proposed to come to the floor, please raise your hand. The motion passes. We have suspended the rules in order to consider this resolution. So, right here, Myrna, could I ask you please now to state the resolution? Response to the humanitarian crisis caused by the Israel-Palestine conflict, we call for an immediate ceasefire and the unconditional release of all hostages. Is I'm sorry. Could I read it back, Murda? May I read that back? Yes. Okay, I'm going to restate the resolution that, that Bernard just read. In response to the humanitarian crisis caused by the Israeli-Palestine conflict, we call for an immediate ceasefire and the unconditional release of all hostages. Is there a second on this resolution? Okay, Goddard Graves seconds it. Is there 
Any discussion about this resolution? I would just like to comment that I think for something like this, it would be better to circulate a petition and get individual signatures rather than to vote as a town. A lot of us aren't even here to put our votes out. Um, I just think it's more of an individual issue. Okay. Yes, Ellie Hayes. I'm similar now by the proposals to be in, in other town business before, and I think it's appropriate. So. Ellie, Ellie says it's, thinks it's appropriate. Yes. Yeah. Um, other other discussion. Yes. Mark. Vermont has a history of making resolutions that are outside the scope of its own. I can't think of one in particular, but I can think of going back to the war. People in Vermont have expressed their opinion through organized bodies such as this. And I think that making even a bit of a news that says the people of this community do want to have a ceasefire because of the humanitarian concerns is worthy of making simply because we care we have ethics we have a proud tradition of caring for people who are part of us okay any more discussion on the resolution i have a yes i have a question Oh, what would be the next step if this is passed? Who's going to be responsible for getting it to whoever they want to get it to? Would that be the library board or you personally or? I, I don't know, but I think we could make it on as a part of our, our end result of today's meeting. It'll be in the notes, it'll be in the summary. Yeah. Okay. This, this is it. It's written as a statement, yeah. it's a resolution. Yeah. Do you know um, we have 60? Yes, I'll recognize Alicia Reddy, yes. 60 of our legis state legislators have voted in favor of a ceasefire, have made an announcement about supporting the ceasefire in our state, our state representatives. It was in, it was in Vermont Twitter two days ago. Alicia, just so I can repeat that, so did you say there was how many state legislators? I think it was 60, 50 or 60. It's 60 state lawmakers recently voiced their support. Senators and our representative also supporting the ceasefire. Okay. Yes? Gary uh, Smith, yeah? yeah. Uh, just that uh, I'm agree that the situation over there is terrible that they shouldn't turn hostages cease hostilities. But and I'll probably vote for your resolution, but I think it's a dangerous precedent to set because there's no vehicle as Diana just showed to present our opinion. And I think it's has a potential of alienating the body, you know, because it's just totally, um, I just don't, I think it's just the name of president to say. Yes, Lord Mackin. Yes, I, um, I'd like to amend that resolution. I think that uh, we should call for lots to lay down their arms and then release the hostages, and then also go for the ceasefire. Yes. Yes. Everyone who started this, Okay, so we're, we're, we're in the middle of discussion on the resolution. Norm has asked for an amendment to the resolution. Yep, and um, just, just so I can be clear on what the amendment is. You want to add to it that Hamas to, that 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 is conditioning. 
that as part of the resolution we call calling for Hamas to lay down their arms. Okay, just give me a moment. Okay. Okay. Now, Norm has made an, uh, a motion to amend this article, this resolution, to include that Hamas lay down their arms. Okay? I'm, I'm sorry? That that was okay? All right. I'm going to keep it straight here. So we have a motion to amend the resolution. Is there a second? David, I see David Morse would like to second that. Okay. So we have a motion to amend. It's seconded. Now we are going to discuss the proposed amendment. Amendment. Okay. Um, Norm, you made the motion, so you you have a right to speak on it first. Would you like to speak on the amend proposed amendment? Okay, um, I think it's um, it's pretty clear how this began, this latest conflict, and it's also clear that Hamas could end it at any time if they want to lay down their arms for these So going for the ceasefire without any kind of resolution to the underlying problem is really helpful. I think. It both things need to happen. The Moss has to lay down the wrong, release the hostages, and have to Okay. Yes, yes, I recognize you, please. Four children have died in the past six months at the hands of the Israeli government than in any other time of war that we have seen. We are arguing a genocide right now, whatever the decision is, I hope that people leave here today and put their hands and their vote to action. But what you are saying is not appropriate, sir. I do apologize for being so direct, but that is just not accurate. What arms, what rights, what power? That is not correct. I, I, I just want to remind the assembly that the the remarks should be addressed here to the moderator. Thank you. Um, recognize Goddard Graves. Yeah, I will probably vote against the amendment simply because, fine, in my sense, fine tuning it is irrelevant to the overarching moral issue. To stand up for peace at any time. It's like standing for virtue against sin. How many people are going to get up here and say, oh, I'm for sin? So that's my position. I don't, I think Myrna's motion is clear, purposeful, and self -evident. So we're, we're still discussing now the proposed amendment. Yes, Michael Gray. So um, I agree that what Hamas did on October 7th was um, Totally over the top, as President Biden likes to use the term. Um, but if you look at the history of Israel and Palestine, it didn't happen or start on October 7th. It's been a hundred year, years of persecution of the Palestinian people um, by Israel. Um, I recognize the right for Israel to be a country from what happened in World War II and their history. Um, but Palestinians have rights to them. I, I would support the amendment if we could get to the to uh, voting on Mirna's thing, but I, I disagree that um, what Hamas did on October 7th was the beginning of uh, maybe the beginning of this present conflict, but it certainly was not the beginning of the uh, persecution of the Palestinian people by Israel. We're still discussing the proposed amendment. Norm, I see you. Before I recognize you, again, I'll, I'll come to the other members and we'll come back. Robbie Gildner. Yes. I think personally, I must agree that we need to consider that we're supporting the Israeli government that is not hiding 
their objective of mass extermination, and that is the capital. Hamas is there as a response to Israel's continued colonization of their land. Their defiance of international legal law for creating settlements in Palestinian lands and continuing to do it. Their government is now fomented for years of plots to exterminate the Palestinian people. Seventy percent of their housing is being destroyed. They have no electricity, they have no water, they have no food. We can't, Joe Biden is saying we're going to uh, drop aid from airplanes. That's a joke. Consider who we're back. Seriously, because these hands are full of Palestinian blood. We have killed 30,000 people, half of whom are children, innocent children. We go to bed at night and sleep peacefully and we look ourselves in the mirror, killing what we're doing with our money. Back to the moment. It's, it's recognized Michael said. Uh, I, well, I wanted to point out that you know earlier today in this meeting we sort of lamented how underfunded at state and potentially federal levels organizations that could be doing great work in our communities are, um, but continue to support funding of proxy wars um, and other things like uh, well, School of the Americas is closed now, but a statement to the federal government that just as my friend saying that our, our hands and our tax dollars shouldn't be going towards foreign wars with, uh, you know, at all, let alone those with objectively, you know, genocidal uh, objectives. Any more discussion? Uh, I'll come back to this. David Morris, yes. Down I like so very odd position for a pacifist talking about this. But, um, there are 25 million Jews left alive in this country, uh, in this world, excuse me. 25 million in the whole world after the Nazi Holocaust. 25 million. There are close to 400 million Arabs. Lots of places, lots of land, lots of resources. Um, uh, the state of Israel is just a little bit, um, depending on which map you use, larger or smaller than the state of the pond. That's the size of the state of Israel. And Thomas has declared their mission is to wipe that state off the face of the earth. The last remaining Jews off the face of the earth. It's their declared purpose. They keep trying. Um, <clears throat> I, and this is really good. This is going to sound like it's totally off subject, but Black Lives Matter. Okay, I suspect most of the people in this room support that organization. Okay, now if you think Black Lives Matter and you're talking about genocide, uh, since uh, Roe versus Wade, there were 60 million abortions in this country. 20 million of them were black babies. There are 40 million black people alive in this country today. 20, 20 million were exterminated since 1973. Um, Margaret Sanger, the godmother of Planned Parenthood, was a eugenicist. One of her principal goals was to exterminate the inferior Negro race. But, and Planned Parenthood has focused on um, minority neighborhoods. Black Lives Matter, if you're, if you're a fan of Black Lives Matter, you should be pro-white. Okay, we're, we're discussing. This is about we're Palestine. Excuse me, just, just for a second, please, just temporarily. We're, we're discussing.
to the proposed amendment. Great. We're, we're discussing the proposed amendment. Yeah. Well, yeah. I understand that, but you want to talk about blood on your hands. When you're really in black beans, you think they have a little more political power, a little more financial power if they were alive? And, and that's 20 million, not 20,000. Okay. Okay. Is, is there more discussion? Lizzie. Just a motion, I guess. Can we just go ahead and bring it to a vote? Okay. Lizzie makes a motion to call the question on the amendment. Is there a second to call the question? Michael Gray seconds that. So, what we have before us right now is whether we cease debate on the amendment and then move immediately to a vote on the amendment. So, this motion right now is to call the question. And this, this is subject to a two-thirds majority, so I'll ask you to raise your hands if you want to call the question. All those in favor of calling this question, please raise your hands. Okay. Okay. Without a count, I'm going to I'm going to say thank you. All those opposed to calling the question. Okay. I see. No. It's it's clear to me that the motion to call the question has passed. Therefore, that brings us to a vote on the proposed amendment made by Norm. And I will read the resolution as, as an up for amendment here. In response to the humanitarian crisis caused by the Israeli-Palestine conflict, we call for an immediate ceasefire and the unconditional release of all hostages and for Hamas to lay down their arms. Did I state that satisfactorily? Yes, I would have put the lay down arms of Hamas before the ceasefire. I'm sorry? In the order of well, it's possible. No. I haven't, I haven't fully stated it yet, so I'd, I'd like to make sure that this is correctly stated as you intended. Okay, okay. So, we called the question. So now we are at the point we are voting on the proposed amendment. All those in favor of amending the resolution as proposed by Norm, Please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Say aye. no. Okay. The no's appear to have it. The no's have it. The proposed amendment does not pass. Now we are back to the resolution as proposed. And we may resume discussion. Okay. okay, okay. So we have a motion to call the question. Ellie, did you make? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Okay, I see Jane, no, Lorendo. Now we, we're back to calling the question, ceasing debate, and coming back to a vote on that resolution. So. Is everyone clear as to what the what the, what this vote amounts to? Okay. Okay. All those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hands. So two thirds. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All those opposed to calling the question, please raise your hands. Okay. It's clear to me that the ayes have it. In this case, the motion to call the question passes, which brings us to a vote on the resolution. The resolution, state once more before we vote. The resolution is in response to the humanitarian crisis caused by the Israeli-Palestine conflict, 
we call for an immediate ceasefire and the unconditional release of all hostages. All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. The resolution is passed. Okay. Okay. Now we are still under Article 33, so the, the debate goes on. Uh, Jane, no Lorenda. I just want to thank you for hurting the cats on your pre town, on uh, your mock town meeting. It was wonderful, and thank you for hurting the cats in this town meeting. So thank you, moderator. Thank you, cats. Okay. Thank you all sincerely. Um, is there any more discussion under Article 33? Hearing none, we'll move on to our last article, Article 34, to adjourn, adjourn the meeting. And, oh, though there were many hands that went up seemingly at the same time, I perceived one before the others at the back of the room. So Roy Demers makes a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Jane No Lorendo seconds. All those in favor of adjourning the 2024 Woodbury Annual Town Meeting, they are. All those opposed say no. The eyes appear to have it. The eyes definitely have it. The meeting is adjourned.